What's going on, Zero to Hear podcast fans? We are back in action. Very fun podcast tonight with a good friend of mine from high school, Anthony Ferrari, uh, currently running a property management business with his uh, brother, doing big things in the world of commercial real estate. This is a very fun conversation. You are going to enjoy it, and I would love to hear feedback. Shoot us a review, subscribe, tell us what you think. We love you guys. Later. I, uh, you know how you remember super vividly, like s- completely random things from your past? Yeah. Oh yeah. All the time. As soon as you said manager of the basketball team, for some reason, the first thing that pops into my head was you commenting on my socks at one of the games. I can't remember exactly <laughs> where the game was, but I was like putting on shoes or something. And you're like, why do you always wear two socks? And I like explained it and you're like, oh, I like that. That's sweet. I do recall this now because you, you had the, it was the double Nike. Yes. I was like, dude, that so I is wore dope. long ones up to here and then short ones. So it was like two Nike checks. And you did, you did that because you didn't want as much slippage. If I remember in the shoe, right? Like, did it give you more? The shoes stability? were a touch big. So I wanted to wear two socks. Gotcha. Like, and so your foot's not moving in the shoe, yeah. right? Cause that's like, you, you're losing traction or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Every little inch, buddy. And then rather than just wear two of the same sock, might as well switch it up. Dude, it was a dope. But I've seen guys in the NBA do it. NFL, they got like, these guys got like three socks on. It seems. Like. <laughs> I heard the guys like in the NBA like would wear like four or five socks. Yeah, some hey, everyone's different, right? There's guys that are probably barefoot. I know guys play soccer barefoot, like all yeah. like, dude. At some point, your foot has got to move more though with too many socks. Like with four or five pairs of socks on, you feel like there's so much cushion that when you're planting, your foot is sliding. I think you just get so sweaty that just like nothing moves. I yeah. don't know. I know guys, even like I heard interviews, like whether it was soccer players or whatever, like switching socks out at halftime or even like uh, basketball every quarter to keep them dry. Like I would, I would be that guy if I was like a pro player, I would need like this, everything like, like perfect. Like I have hockey guys, they throw their gloves between the shift, yeah. baby powder inside, like dry them up. They give them right back. I'd be like, dude, this is, un- this would be unreal. I'd be way better. I, I just tell myself this, right? Like I'm playing beer league yesterday. I got holes in my gloves. Like. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it would be unreal. I'd, I would be the, like, I'd be that guy on the team, like the trainer getting everything for me. You should hire someone to come to your beer league games and powder your gloves. How every trainer, time you yeah. come off, every time you come off the ice, just tossing them over your shoulder. Dude, that, I would pay powder. for that. Come up with the smelling salts. You ever see that in hockey? They bring them down and get that going. Yeah. Just get like, get a little massage. Oh, that'd be unreal. I think guys would do it too, man. It's expensive enough already. So probably pay a guy 20. Nah. How long is the 50 game? bucks for a game. Hour and a half? Um, yeah, it's an hour yeah. and a half. 40 bucks. Pretty cold. Get the team to chip in. He'll just powder everyone's gloves. Perfect. Amazing. Think about for soccer. We played Bo's Grape. We had like a full-on trainer. It would have made it a little more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> Could they have censored me against the referees? No, that's... Because I think that was our biggest problem. Dude, that happens even all the way to the top, right? Like you see, <laughs> it, there's so much pressure on those guys. I got respect for, for refs, man. I don't. And I've yelled at a lot of refs before. <laughs> You've seen it. It's it's hard, man. It's I agree. It's, it's hard. It's crazy. I joke around a lot. And how about the pressure, like on in professional sports? It's crazy. Like what was it? Was it the Seahawks uh, Green Bay game? Like the huge controversy, like a couple years back, three years back. Me and Alex Thurman went to that game. You were at that game. At the game. That was the last game of the replacement refs. This oh, this is what it was. The Remember refs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the that there was, was so many like ridiculous calls throughout the game. But the la- do you remember the end of the game? I remember the replacement refs. So it was week three. Me, if it was in Seattle against Green Bay, Thurman and I go down for the game. And Unreal game. Yeah, last Thurman, play of the Packers game. Fan, right? Yeah. Last play of the game. Uh, Wilson throws like a deep corner to the end zone. I think we were down by like f- whatever three or f- five or something. And I think it was Baldwin. I think Baldwin goes up and like catches it, but so does the DB. So they both have their hands on it. Come down to the ground. And there's two refs right there. Yeah. One goes touchdown and the other goes <laughs> no incomplete. No way. <laughs> it's the best like meme right like, now too. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. And it was the biggest news. It was like. And so the Seahawks just like run. It was the last right. play of the game. So the Seahawks just run off the field. Pete Carroll is literally on the field being like, get in the locker room. Because right, he called room. a touchdown. Because he called yeah. touchdown. Yeah. And then uh, they show the replay and obviously the Packers fans are so mad. Oh, it was. And they were probably reviewing that on Sportsnet and all that stuff for 
like weeks throughout the but season. But the, the Seahawks got the win. Yeah. They did. They, well, they stole they, the win. Yeah, they, they called that touchdown. One. Yeah, that, I remember that. So it's a case in point, I guess. You need good refs, man. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about new rules and stuff in the NFL. Yeah, talking about... I, the PI one is big this year. It's huge. And it's frustrating. Yeah. I, don't you, would you agree? I think it is literally pointless. At, at this point, I have not... like. Why, why would you have this rule? And then has there even been one play overturned? Carl, can you look that up? I think it, it, there might not have even been one overturned. I, I think it was this week. I think someone challenged a pass interference that I was watching. Maybe it was the Sunday night game or something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> someone challenged it and the commentator okay. said it was like, there's been 56 or something times that they've challenged the PI call in the NFL this year. Okay. And two have been overturned. Okay. So it's, I think that's the numbers. Yeah, it's yeah, something yeah. like that. Disgusting yeah. if that's the case. But doesn't it show, okay, there's obviously something wrong with the way we've a, either like written this rule, how mm. we're enforcing it, or I don't, yeah, I don't know. The rule know. came in solely because of the New Orleans Saints game last year, right? Was that last year? That was last year in the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. last play. I, yeah, I, I went, from what I read, that was a huge it was, pushing. That was reason. horrible. That was, it was really bad. Yeah. It was like two seconds before the ball got there. And Straight the up tackled, tackled him. him. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the rule came in because of that. And Which the, the cool. wording of the rule is like egregiously pass interference. Whatever the hell egregiously means. I don't know. Horrible word to choose. I know. It's like that's some anchorman <laughs> shit, man. They, they chose like a word that sounds unreal. Could you just imagine if they it. asked Will Ferrell? Like Will yeah. Ferrell's in the meeting. He's just like Guys, erroneous. Yeah. On all accounts. <laughs> like, I swear, where did you? Don't like you just, they left themselves open to just be chirped. Using that word. So now, but like, now coaches think they can challenge everything, anything that's borderline pass interference yeah. that probably should have been called, but they're not going to turn it over or overturn it because it's not this, whatever, this made up word egregious. But if I'm a coach, I'm, I'm like, I take a shot too. And if Pete Carroll's not, he's tossing that thing every oh, game yeah. and he's heavy on it, but I would be the same. I mean, you got to take the, you got to go for it, man. I mean, depends on the point of the game too, but yeah, it seems, uh, they need to really figure that out to, to me, to pick the pace of the game up. Absolutely. I think that's where the NFL could falter. I mean, do they own a day of the week? Um, I, they're that, that's not going anywhere anytime soon. I don't even so. know how to. I'm looking up egregious, and I have no idea how to spell. <laughs> I've tried it three times, and it has not popped the up. The spell checker is not even helping you. No, I think it's a Greg <laughs> I O U S egregious, something like that. Oh, was that close? Maybe two G's. Does it start with an E? Egregious? I thought it was an A. Oh. Is it an A or <laughs> the an E? The definition makes sense. You're going to laugh so hard. Wait, can you tell me if it's an A or an E first? It's an E. So oh, E, shit, I Greg, I-O-U-S. Okay. The definition. Outstandingly bad, colon, shocking. <laughs> shocking. <laughs> <laughs> that That is horrible, right? Like that. It totally makes sense, though. How, outstandingly, there's many shocking plays. In outstandingly the- bad. That's hilarious. I, and I wonder how they, like, you know, there was a lawyer involved with that. Mm-hmm. How did they fall upon that <laughs> word? Shocking. Like, how can a PI, that was a shocking PI. What did he like shocking. jab him like in the <laughs> ribs when he went out? Like, I don't know. Do you, yeah. guys, do you guys know that uh, fucking NBA coaches can now throw challenges? Do they have a flag? I hope they I have a flag. Know th- yeah. So no. you can like challenge fouls and stuff. Really? Yeah. That's going to slow the game. And that'll slow that. Like, and I know the NHL did this. We're talking years back. Um, I, I think it's it's going to be it's a fine line. You have to you you need these rules to be challenged. I think, but it's got to be quick, man. You can't be waiting. They got to go to commercial break, and there's like thirty seconds to a minute, and it's like, yeah, it just adds at to least it. most NFL challenges are probably like three to five minutes. Because they get together, they talk about it, then they review it, go and back and forth. Because the yeah. guy, the head ref, watches it on that mm-hmm. screen. And he's got the headphones on talking to New York or wherever the head office is. So it's, I don't know. But then how about VAR, where, you know, VAR, they're doing it. They're just in the headpiece and they have, there's another referee doing that. That seems a lot quicker. I feel like the way they've done it. Didn't they go watch a screen too, though? So they were doing that last year. Now I believe they're not. It was just too slow? In the games, they're just like, they're in their earpiece. Mm -hmm. I think someone else is already on the horn, like another ref. While the game is still going on? No, he's like, the game is stopped. Like, okay. guys will usually be le- yelling at him if it's like for a, for a PK or something. But he's just like, wait, I'm over. And then he'll, once he does the signal, then that, they know that that's getting reviewed. 
And then he's chilling, waiting for the. Anyways, I think it's you need it. Like our attention span a isn't getting going to get any better than mm-hmm. the, the coming in the future here. Yeah, it's going to get worse if anything. Like we're going to be watching like snippets of games eventually. The way our attention span is going. What's the solution for it? Let's talk about NFL specifically because soccer is a completely different mm. beast. I think. Yeah, for NFL, what's the solution? Um, it seems like every year they're just adding things that you can challenge, right? So eventually you're going to be cha- be able to challenge anything and everything. What can you do? Just remove challenges? Have less during I don't, a game? Yeah. I don't think that's the answer because there's too much human error. Yeah. And in big 100%. games like the Super Bowl or like that uh, Saints game last year, you can't make a team lose because of a terrible call. I, th- I think you need the, like you need to automate it, like quote unquote, in, in some Just way. Have it faster. To, to happen faster. Whether that's, I don't know, maybe there's going to be some algorithm in the future that like can it's just like watching all the plays like, and they can, you have can, like sensors on the ball sensors <laughs> on the cre- lines, hey, yeah. do, do you like think, tennis i don't think that's far-fetched yeah i don't think so you're exactly right tennis like that mm-hmm. that's a brilliant system what they have right so then the refs don't have to worry about it right they're just talking to someone those guys that team point. figures it out and that's it the call comes in you know like you see the tennis mm-hmm. it's real quick man like that might be the, that, that's a great point that might be the quickest review system at some point so, do refs just become eliminated that's another great like because the f- the prime example for me is baseball. I don't think umpires are needed at all because no. they show you the it's stupid computer, strike zone yeah. and they show you exactly where the pitch goes. They sh- it, they it, replay the outs and, and you can just watch the out. like someone could yeah. watch the outs from a TV. And screen. The umpire's kind of guessing, right? He has like a rough estimate of where and the square should talk be. About exactly. human error. Talk about human error. Exactly. How many times outside the strikes? But whatever. you can't challenge strikes. You can challenge outs on bases. But you're right. There could just be some sort of, there's just a com- supercomputer behind home plate. Just some guy with a megaphone <laughs> watching a screen. <laughs> but you're right. Like, that is a or good, it's just I like would, Siri. Siri's just yelling. Dude, I think in our lifetime, I would imagine we would see the time in, in some of these professional sports where there'll be no, no referee. Yeah. Baseball All, makes the most sense. Football, there's like too many things too going many on. Too many variables. Like, un- yeah. And I think a there's lot just, of- There's just, you need multiple, I guess you could do it from a, like a booth watching the screens. Well, you'd have every angle, right? Mm-hmm. If there's, if it's like a supercomputer, some sort of crazy system. You Cameras everywhere. Every everywhere. angle, yeah. anything that could happen on that field. So maybe instead That's of one ref, it's a team, team of five per ref, you know? Dude, it's- But not on the field? No, not on the field. Just looking at cameras, making calls like that. Yeah, that's- So you just have one- you probably need a human or some sort of robotic arm that places the football <laughs> down every time, right? You get a drone to drop. <laughs> it's going to happen. This is going to be some, some future level shit it right just, here. Like in the Women's World Cup. I think it was the Women's World Cup last year. They drove year. it out. Yeah, they had the they little drew, remote control I, cars. I remember this. I remember this. <laughs> that was... Uh, yeah, but that's... Uh, I, if you're going to talk about like the future of mm-hmm. the NFL especially, I mean... But does the NFL want to speed up the games? That's the thing. And I don't think they do. That's a, you got two great points here. So they <laughs> want they want the commercial breaks. They want more as many money. breaks as they can. Just fucking counting money. How do you think they're? Yeah, it's you're exactly right. The advertising <laughs> dollars pump those commercials in, especially Super Bowl. Like you look how ridiculous some of these like advertising the costs are. They're five million dollars for thirty seconds. Do you think we can have a five Gary, hour Super Bowl one year? Gary Vee was talking about the Super Bowl ads being one of, if not the most underpriced marketing tools. Really? If you can afford $5 million, he's just like, the goal of any marketing campaign is to gain attention. How do you get attention? See the well, most, and the most all high. of America is watching that game, regardless of whether they give a shit about football or not. Exactly. And if a small fraction, even now they have your, if it's a company or whatever, that's in their mind, mm-hmm. you've already, that's already paid for itself essentially because subconsciously then they're going to go towards mm-hmm. your company, man. It's all, it's all, uh, it's pretty crazy with advertising and everything like. We're, we're getting sucked in. man. Do any sports not have referees or do them digitally? I guess tennis would be the closest. Like you don't really need that dude sitting in a chair. Yeah. I don't know. I if don't know. Do you need the lines people? There's still lines people that are yelling, right? Yeah, there are. For some of the faults, I think they still, they still yell it on the baseline. I think they always do. They always like go in or they yell if it's out. Yeah, that's it. Did definitely. There still is like there's the chair umpire, and then there's the people mm. around that get hit. Especially the little boys get hit in the balls usually. <laughs> like, those are the best videos on Twitter, man. Just like a 95 <laughs> kilometer an hour tennis ball, or when they coming at you. <clears throat> you know, there's like the wall behind that where the stands start. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
There was one the other day, or uh, maybe in the summer, the Ugg Ugg ball girl was running back and tripped and just face planted into the wall. Oh, no way. Yeah, it was. I don't think I saw that one. And it was like as the guy was like going through his serve routine and obviously it made noise. So he looks around and he's like, what the hell happened? Oh, dude, it was pretty good. Those are good. good. Yeah, it's. Yeah, but I don't think there is any like automated refing system that I can think of. Even in like I'm thinking of, like F1, there's still guys watching it. Um, yeah, when will that switch happen to? That's combat sports. It's all judges. Yeah, that at the end of the day you're gonna need right. That's another you, problem. You need someone two, to split people up. You guys right? beating the shit out of each other. <clears throat> yeah. Or do robots just get so good that it's just a robot doing it? <clears throat> I hope it doesn't get to that. Robots are. I was cool. listening to a podcast, a Joe Rogan podcast the other day, and there's like multiple companies that sell sex robots now. Oh yeah, oh, they're definitely. everywhere. Yeah. Have you lo- have you googled them? Yeah. See what they look like. Yeah. Do they Some look, look anything like real. a person? But it's still Funny, about, you yeah. have that the uncanny valley, right? That's what it's called. Like you look at them and you know something is off with their face, right? But some people, I think, get off on that. Like they have a fetish. <laughs> the human. Humankind is a is a funny beast, man. Yeah. Well, how about like you guys seen Ex Machina? Man, that, yeah. It oh, looks yeah. so real. So talk about that. Like that's that's a hell of a movie, man. That's a good movie. And I don't think we're at that. Po- well, maybe we are at that point. Like, can they, if you can make a robot look like that, I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know if it I looks could. pretty real. <laughs> Never leave no, your like, house. You're right, you can tell. A, you can tell. There's that close up in Ex Machina. You couldn't tell. No. But if you just glance at that photo, you'd think it's a real, just like a girl posing. Yeah, quickly, if you're looking at it quickly, yeah. Until you touch her rubber skin. <laughs> that's. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Would you say it's egregious? Wait, shocking. Indeed. Indeed. That is a, that's a great word for it. That is shocking. It's so, oh man. That Should we get a doll for the podcast? Me. Yeah, like a doll? Just, just put it right in the corner. Can we make Chester into like a, a large life size? <laughs> Life size. It'd be a nice addition. You know, like you know, like the, all the late night TV shows. They always got like their other host, right? Like usually off in the corner. <laughs> you could just have her like a little day bed. Maybe you put a little install a little day bed here. We should get like a cell or uh, like a painting done of me, you, and Chester, and put it on the wall right there. <laughs> like a hand drawn. We'll get someone in here. There we go. We'll fucking sit here for hours and. <laughs> I could dig that. <clears throat> We're going to Pump Springs next week, dude. How pumped are you? It's one of the greatest times of year. Tell Carl how much you love it. I'm going to go get some sake. Yes, yes. Did I, like I, did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, I believe it's sake, but I think you, you said it pretty close. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to get too nitpicky about that, but yeah, Palm Springs, man. You ever been, Sibs? You ever, Never. You've been to Cali though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How much golf are you playing right now? These these animals are playing mm-hmm. a lot of golf. Are, mm-hmm. you doing, are you doing seven and seven or six rounds? I'm going to probably play like, three or four i won't play as much as them uh just a little bit a couple of days i i have to like i'm gonna try to ride for like five six hours so you're gonna bring your bike down there yeah yeah i just i brought it back i brought it down last year i think for yeah last year was the first time there yeah i bring it down just wrap it up and uh go to town over there man perfect weather lots of nice trails they got they got some good uh yeah i i map it out on my like kind of gps and just Sometimes I just get lost around there too. I know some new routes this time, so yeah. I'll try that out. But yeah, there's great riding um, anywhere in California. Do you do you plan to do like a certain amount of kilometers or do you just fucking... There's always... Like sh- I always aim for a certain amount. Yeah. Uh, fuck, you never... I never know how the body's going to feel. Right. And then... There's always landmarks and shit you want to see yeah, too, right? I, so. Like with the whole cycling thing, man, I, I try not to put too much pressure on myself to like, okay, ride x amount of kilometers like you can it's it's a sport like any sport you can like get wrapped up in the stats just min max yeah and i try to stay away like i grew up my whole life kind of in that i feel like like with hockey and yeah. and football and then even cycling like when i first started and i'm like now i just want to ride pure with like i don't care mm-hmm. if i can get out for a long like a long ride awesome if i can't like i'm not gonna be choked about it like just try to take a bit of the pressure off, but mm-hmm. yeah, I'll tr- my I will try to ride like a, for me it's like the most I can ride. Mm-hmm. So if I can go there and ride like a thousand kilometers in a week, I'd be like, dude, that's fuck unreal. yeah, Jesus, dude. But we'll see. Like, but I want to go. I also want to go play golf yeah, yeah. and then go ride. Like, I want to get the best of that day. Like, I think I did that a couple times. We we, we 
we play in the morning, mm-hmm. like like what, 6.30 a.m. tee off. And yeah. then we get back and I still have like, from like one to six, it's light out. And it's like 20 <laughs> plus like degrees. 4.30. Yeah, or 4.30. It gets dark early. This it, time, feels, yeah. it feels a lot longer. Anyway, they can go get it like four hours nice. on a good ride. And wow. I did that a couple of times. I'm like, yes, this is, it's my like ideal day. And you, you've never had problems at the airport? No. With the bike? With the bike? Yeah. No. It folds oh. up. Oh, uh, so it folds have, up into a carrying case. Or last year you did. That one's crazy. Uh, so I have one that actually it my ba- my bike literally goes into a backpack. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. This is Transformers like throw it out. Dude, it's crazy. They, <laughs> they're and talking about like marketing and advertising, this yeah. company says like they're they do a great job in advertising. They're like, yeah, be an airport ninja. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, what? But then they have the like literally they've made it so that it's right under the um the max measurements to be oversized so i don't have to pay bike fees mm. but you have to take a lot more of the bike apart hence right. it's a little bit longer like it's maybe 15 minutes to to take apart then put together like when you get somewhere mm-hmm. i have another bag that i can just take the wheels off and just drag her on mm-hmm. i'll probably bring that this time that you have to is and, that a pay and i gotta one? pay but you know what yeah. depends on the airline usually it's like 50 bucks or mm-hmm. 30 bucks <laughs> So it's, I'll take it. But yeah, never, I've luckily, like I haven't had a problem yet, but there are stories of people getting yeah. their, yeah. their frame smashed. Dude, I wrapped the shit out of mine. Like, <laughs> I take from my brothers, from the mechanical company, I'm taking all the pipe insulation and I'm like <laughs> double wrapping it. So I take, yeah. If you take a bit of effort to secure it, you should be pretty, unless they're tossing it. Right. But I've always thought about putting like a little camera on my golf bag just to see what it goes yeah. through. See how. Because they, bags, right? like, even like when they put them back on the whatever roundabout bullshit thing that comes back on, you can hear them just tossing oh, yeah. them. Yeah. And he, cause like, you've never put, you've never, have you ever wrapped like the top of the bag? Do you know, or is it a hard, do you have a the hard bag case to travel? No, it's not hard, but the bag that I have has padding on the top. Gotcha. But how, no, I, who I, knows I what people even, are doing? That's right? the like, first time I thought about that. You're just getting them tossed thing. around. They've come out okay so far. Yeah, but they, I think they're pretty good. Like that's all you, the best is the Palm Springs airport. Like you go to the oversized and all it is just, it's just all (laughs) golf bags coming out. The occasional bike. I saw a couple people with bikes, but it's just like golf bags. I'm like, this, this is a great fucking place, man. It is. eh? I love it. I, yeah. I remember the first time coming in, man. That was, this would be my third year doing it with you, right? Is it only three? I think it's my third. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but it's, for me, it's the time like, it's, you know, it starts getting fucking cold here now. Yeah. And I'm like, I need sun. Like, so it's, to me, it's, it can't come soon enough. And I love it. And it's like, it's a great time of year for me work-wise to do it. Like in November, once it starts getting super shitty weather in, in uh, Vancouver, it's so nice to just get out of, out of it for a week. Oh fuck with the time change now. It's just sad. It's so dark. We need to get, we can get on a whole nother tangent about this, but get Fucking rid of this. 530 get rid of this. Dark. But, uh, yeah. Um, what were we just talking about? Time change and then I said something before that. Palm Springs. Gonna go on it. Getting out of Vancouver. Getting out. Oh yeah, dude. That's that's the ultimate goal, man. Getting out of here. Like this time of year, moving to my my second uh home somewhere hot, man. That's it's like I need it. I need sun for so from now till come back here on March, April. And then this is the best place on the planet through the summer and yeah. Do you like Palm Springs? Is that option? Cause I mm. love that place. I haven't done a ton of traveling. I've, we went to Scottsdale for Ray's bachelor party. Yeah. Which was fun, but the golf courses are just too far away for me. Yeah. I remember that. There's more like nightlife stuff happening and there's more young people there. For sure. But I assume that when we're going to be taking this plunge into living outside of Vancouver for three or four months a year, we're probably not going to be 28. <laughs> no, no, that's, yeah, right? that's the thing. It's probably like in your fifties. My place isn't, it, I don't even think it's in the States, to be honest. Um, yeah, if I did pick right now, I, I would say Columbia is where I would I'd set up shop. Just the cost of, the initial cost of like the investment of like moving over there or building something is like way, is like half of what would be in the States or here. I'm surprised it's even that much, to be honest. Half? Yeah. It's, maybe it, it depends where, but. In Medellin, where I would go, crazy cycling culture. Yeah, it's cheap, and you could set up something just in the mountains, and and that's and it's it's a city of eternal spring, so it's it's like twenty degrees all the way around. It's 
freaking unreal, man. Really? Yeah. And I don't like it too hot. So it's like, it's just perfect. Hmm. And I could cycle every day at altitude where you, you gain like, you have crazy. So it's so much harder. It's actually like, it's natural doping. That's why every pro cyclist does it or a triathlete. Like, have you ever trained, have you ever been at altitude and like done an exertion, like a big effort? Have you ever, like Denver is probably the closest we can do. So dude, I went to, I just did Columbia and I was there in end of August and I did like a week altitude training. So I was at 20, I was living at 2,800 meters. So like, that's like uh, two gross mountains. I was living at that level and then riding at that. And the first day I'm like, holy shit, I, I'm going to have a heart attack. You do, I did like an hour, just an hour like ride. And we did a couple, just going up a couple of hills. And like, so what happens is your heart rate goes max. Right. And then it stays there. Yeah. So here it starts to, even if you're still doing the same effort, it should kind of drop down a bit. Mm-hmm. There it stays, it stays that level. And you're like, holy shit, what's going on? And you're not doing like a huge effort. So that first day is a real big shock. You kind of get, you, you obviously get used to it. It takes any, anyone from like one to three days, even a bit longer to get used to it. Mm-hmm. it. Took me one day. The next day you start feeling like better next day, like unreal. And then like better and better because the air is thinner. So it's, I think I pro- I might be butchering this, but it's definitely like, it's less exertion to get that amount of, o- like the same amount of oxygen in. Your body just gets more efficient, right? Or processing it. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, the first couple of days, it's like shock therapy. And then I came back here and I felt like I was so strong <laughs> really? for like a month for like block after. Yeah. So, so if you see, sorry, a lot of I, pros, they're going, they do altitude training before like the Tour de France. And then they come into that. It's also big in the UFC. So people say that what you're supposed to train at altitude and then rest at sea level. Yeah, exactly. If that's ideal, right? And then mm-hmm. especially if you're if you're fighting at sea level and you had trained at altitude, yeah. your cardio right away you'll have an advantage over Huge. someone who is right. not doing that. So there's always an advantage when you go to play like the Broncos. They are used to that climb, like they're used to that. It's it's pretty slight because they're not as high. But there is right. a disadvantage for the away team every time. The Nuggets too. You hear teams talk about it all the time. And they'll go in even, I know, especially if they can, they'll get into, like when they play the Avalanche, NHL teams will get in there two days early if they can. Really? To let the guys acclimatize. So you think the, the Sherpas on Everest are the best, most in shape people on the planet? <laughs> 100%. percent are joking, but 100%, no, dude. So. Even like, I remember doing, like in Machu Picchu, doing the trail, uh, me, and, me and Perko did that, and... The porters, those are the guys that actually carry all your shit. Like you have a backpack every day for four days, but then you have like your other, you have to bring like your sleeping bag and all this. These guys carry it for you. They have like 70 or 100, 70 to 100 pounds in their backs every day. And these guys are doing like to like 25 kilometer days walking on the trail, on the, on the trail. So they get your stuff from your camp. The next day they get it to your next camp. And these guys are doing this every day and they're chewing on coca leaves. And it's like, it's, that's one of the craziest things I've seen in my travels, man. These guys, I was inspired. I'm like, they're like, they're tiny. Little, yeah, little, just regular looking dudes, man. So they're the, they're the indigenous people of Peru, right? Yeah. So they're like our, they're like our native uh, Canadians here, like the, like Indians, right? It's, um, it's, they're the native population there. And mm-hmm. they're just, man, they're, yeah, their conditioning is crazy <laughs> for what they're doing every day. Like no one could handle that here on the day-to-day basis. And they don't have any fancy backpacks or nothing. Like it's, it's old school. What are coca leaves? So co- like it's where eventually they get cocaine derived from. Like a coca leaf is like the pure form. Uh, it's a leaf in nature. What does chewing on it do? So chewing on it, it kind of mm. gives you, it's a very small dose of like what cocaine eventually would. It, it gives you like a little bit of a serotonin hit, mm. but it's very mild. But it's like they sell that in supermarkets there, like little... Markets on the side of the road, you can buy a bag of coca leaves. It's not considered, it's actually a sacred plant mm-hmm. for the indigenous people. So they won't, like the government doesn't go after anything. Like it's, well, there's obviously like the Americans coming in with the war on drugs and we can get into this whole thing, but there's pressure from that. But then there's like the native American, like the native uh, Peruvians that are like, no, this is a sacred plant for us. Like you're not touching this. And they're all chewing it. Yeah, it's crazy. And it gives you, it's like, it's kind of mm-hmm. like a coffee high. Like it gives you a bit of a, just that energy to keep going. Mm. You see these guys with like a big dip in their mouth. Like it's, it's, it's pretty crazy to see, 
But yeah, talking about yeah, those the Sherpas even in Everest would be on another level. Like they would come here and like crush the gross grind. Or whatever. Like, <laughs> oh my god! They would just dummy it. Like, <laughs> does it get to a point where it's bad for you or no? L- living that high? That's a good question. I mean, I. The thing is, that they're born there, right? That's all they know, and it's generations and generations. You're, yeah, you're straight. You're acclimatized to it. It's <clears throat> that's the crazy thing too about Colombia, man. Like I, you see guys like they're crazy climbers. Like in cycling, to be a climber, you got to be like really small, like no body fat. And right now, well, the best. Arguably the best cyclist in the world is Colombia, and he won the Tour de France. Like tiny guy, man, like a buck twenty. Really? Yeah, maybe maybe one thirty, and he's crazy. And these guys can just climb, but they're all born at. He was born, uh, I think he's just outside of Bogota, so they're even higher. And he's probably born at like yeah, in the two thousand, maybe three thousand meters above sea level. He's born at that, and that's all he knows growing up. Hmm. And it makes you that much better of like, an, especially as an endurance athlete, because okay. it's all, all about the oxygen, right? Like. Yeah, man, it's natural doping. They're on another level. Is that the f- your favorite place you've been? Uh, it's tough to see. Man, I always got Marty to ask me this. Like, what's your top three? What's your top five? Like, I've been fortunate enough to be to, like, I've been to a lot of places, man. And yeah, Columbia is like in my top. Like, I don't have like a favorite place. Like, I have many unreal places I've been to. And mm-hmm. I like to think they're all kind of like equal in their own way. Like, yeah, Columbia is up there 100%. Um, probably like Bolivia like also in South America, like just cause it was like raw, like it's like going back in, in history a bit just to see like another culture. And then Peru and Japan, Japan was crazy too. Japan. Like eh? There's a lot of places, man. Yeah. You, and you, you took your bike there and you were cycling and all Japan that. Japan was the first time I took my bike and oh. like, I'm like, I'm going to go do a little bike tour. My sister was living in Japan. Uh, that was the ori- like the original reason I went. So my sister was living there for like a year teaching English and right when she went, I was like so proud of her. I'm like, well, yo, I got an excuse to go to Japan now. Like, I'll, I'm gonna come see you like as quick as I can. So uh, I booked like I went there for like three weeks, man. I'm like, stayed with her. She showed me around. I said I was really getting into cycling. I'm like, I'm gonna bring my bike. They are they're known for some crazy bike routes there, and so I did that. Like, did a couple, probably rode like ten days on that trip. So it's it's pretty popular in Japan? Yeah, they have a crazy cycling culture. Really? It's dope. So if you know anything about the Japanese people, first of all, they're like the most meticulous <laughs> culture. They will take your shit and they will make it like they'll try to perfect it. So like when you go to Japan, mm-hmm. like they're known they have like I think they might have the most Michelin star restaurants in the world. So they'll they'll take like Italian cuisine and they'll just kill it. Like they'll they'll make their own restaurant. Their food's insane. So with bikes too, they'll do this. Like, like it's like uh, they have crazy. These guys are like artists, man. What they do with like building bikes. Mm. So it's it's it was cool to see that. Like I went to some crazy bike shops there. Where I saw the most beautifully crafted bikes. Like, and so you see that, and then yeah, you see their bike routes. Like they're so clean and beautiful. And I'm like, dude, this yeah. I, if I could move somewhere like tomorrow with like no fuss, I would move to Kyoto, Japan, because it's just like. Yeah, it's so clean, safe, and it, you could just like move there tomorrow and you'd be like, this is dope. Like everything's set for you. Yeah, it's, I don't know, that's the place that like, it's always tops my list, I think. Is crazy. Do you ever feel unsafe in Colombia? Um, there's like a couple times, but for the most part, no, it's a very safe place. Is it? Yeah. But like people see that you have a nice bike, no one approaches you. No, so like... Oh, that's a great question, Carl. That is a great question. But once you see the cycling culture there, it is um, like besides soccer or football, like it's, it's that's number two. It wow. might be on par. Like it's, that's how much their culture loves cycling. So that, I think they, they respect a lot, a lot more. And I mean, when we're going and riding, like I'm not leaving my bike kind of out in the open, right? Like we're going to cafes, we're out in the middle of nowhere kind of, you're always, your bike's with you, like, when you have a, a nicer road bike, you don't usually like lock it up and like leave it like out of sight. Like you're usually just going on rides and like it's within eyesight mm-hmm. or you go to like cafes that have that can accommodate it. But yeah, no, I, man, I felt pretty safe there. Like there's some sketchy stuff where they'll, they'll kind of target like tourists in a way. Yeah. So they'll, there'll be like police checks, um, around like certain clubs that I kind of could tell, but it's just to make sure like you don't have drugs on you or you're not doing anything stupid. Like, I did have a time, like our first time we went there though, you know, the story of, uh, Martin and my buddy, Martin yeah. and Carm got, got robbed like our second night in Columbia. 
So people would think, oh, well, you don't think it's unsafe there, but it was, this is like 4 a.m., like dark road. I had left early, so I didn't get robbed. I was already back at the hostel, but they're out like, you know, 4 a.m. And they like, long story short, they just got like put up on a wall and like the cops took their money, but they didn't like, they pulled their phones out. My buddy Marty's like showing him like we had gone to a soccer game that day, like the local soccer uh, game. <laughs> and Marty's like, he's like, look, I went to this game. And like, and, and then I think the guy started laughing at him, like the cop. It was, these were policemen, by the way. Um, anyways, they gave them their phones back. Like, it's not like they were, they weren't right. trying to like, like fuck you up and take your phones or whatever. Like, they didn't, they didn't take the phones. They took their money. You just want easy cash, right? Which was like 150 bucks. And then they just let them go. But these were like two cops on motorcycles. So and that was in Bogota, which I heard, and I kind of get got the vibe. It was a little more sketchy, but mm-hmm. uh, Medellin, very safe. Like that's the other spot I love, where I was talking about where I where I cycled, and I don't, I wouldn't say it's dangerous at all. Like it's it's getting more renowned in the world for being um, like a new tourist like hotspot because of like what the mayor the mayor's done some crazy, like some out of the box thinking. Like there's an escalator in um in the like their like favela area that like takes essentially like the impoverished people it's a way better it's a quicker way to get them to like where they can go to work really yeah it's man i'll show you i'll, I'll show you it on uh I'll, I'll send it to you on google after it's it's crazy like so he's done stuff like that like he's uh g- great stuff with like public works and like public planning like plazas and so it's it's crazy man it's a really cool city they have uh, also like a gondola to bring people from the favelas hmm. like how we do like we go up like gross they have one like in the city because uh, Medellin is actually, it's super unique where it's uh it's a city essentially that feels like you're in a stadium because you're surrounded by mm. mountains all the way around. And it's bizarre. Like I, that's why I love it. So they have like, it's pretty high elevation. So they have like a gondola from the bottom to the top, like area where you can get to work or, or what have you. So that's pretty cool, man. Cause that's the yeah. thing in South America, right? It's the, like the impoverished people that build up high on mountains. Right. And it's then the opposite. Yeah. Of what here, we anywhere. Here. In, in America, like in LA, especially the people like Hollywood Hills, yeah. like people that live in the Hills have loot. Like those are the people that go up there. It's the opposite in Columbia. Like you live in the center, you live in the high rises. Like there's, there's some homes kind of on the outskirts of like the center. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, yeah. Like you can see the favelas. Like even when I was in Brazil, like you can, you can see it, man. Like it's just like shanty towns, yeah. right? It's like just tin, tin homes, and it's that's the crazy part. And then you see, like when I was there for the World Cup, they literally installed concrete retaining walls in front of the favelas, so that like on TV they would pan to it, and you wouldn't see, you wouldn't <laughs> see that. Yeah, dude, yeah. it's crazy the lengths that I, I'm going on a tangent, but it's crazy what like they went to to kind of like so the world didn't see that. Yeah. Have you just been there once? I've been to Brazil. Yeah, I no, went uh, to Colombia. To Colombia. No, I've been there twice. So I went with uh, I went with Marty the first time, and then we went. I just went this time to because I had some connections with cycling now there, and which has been which has been awesome. That kind of that got me fired up too. Did you do yeah. a big bike trip in Italy this year? Yeah, I did that in in May. I went there. I went to the Giro d'Italia, which is dope. Yeah. So that's like so. There's most people who don't even know a lot about cycling. They know the Tour de France. The Giro d'Italia is like the second most prestigious race, mm. stage race in cycling. Did you time yourself? Well, no. I So I did, what I did is you can go there and you can ride some of the courses. So it's, it's crazy what these guys do. These guys do 21 stages um, over like a three week span. Yeah. They get like basically two rest days. Fuck. It's nuts what they do. It's actually been proven that it's like very unhealthy oh, yeah. what they do to themselves. So I just did the first set. I followed the first seven stages and there was some bad weather at certain ones. So I was like, I wasn't going to go ride in like the piss and rain. But anyways, I tried to do a lot of those stages and I just, yeah, I always, anytime I go on the bike, I have my computer, which times my rides and shows your speed and what have you. So yeah, I did that on all those rides and it was cool to like see what the pros kind of tackle and then seeing them do it. And it was like, how do you compare? Uh, I mean, I'm, like I can see them way up the road. No, they, yeah, it's, they're on another level, man. Like I, th- you think you're, you're good at something and then you yeah. get humbled. Like that's yeah. cycling is like, to me, the most humbling sport. That's why I'm like, I love it. Cause it's, you think you're getting stronger or whatever. And then there's, <laughs> there's always, yeah, it's crazy what these guys do. Absolutely crazy. How'd you get into cycling? Um, 
It's only been like it was four or five years. Four or five years, yeah. The weird, so I remember when I was, so I grew up, I'll give you a little context. So grew up playing like hockey, like hockey is my life. Like mm-hmm. wanted to play in the NHL. I could straight up, so like that was like, from like eight years old, try to try to make in hockey, whatever. Don't make it, so then play football a bit, like try that out, whatever. Play hockey again. But then my body, because I was like, I had to prove myself that I could play like at a kind of high level, whatever. Try to do that. And then my body was like fucking done, man. Like trying to play soccer too for those couple of years <laughs> just to, because I love soccer. My body was banged up, concussions, like going through, like we can go on a whole thing on that. But so my body had taken a, what I thought was a pretty good beating. And I'm like, I need to stay like, I don't know, I'm crazy. I need to be like competitive on a daily basis, whether it's <laughs> against like someone or myself. Or I just need to stay moving too to be like sane, like to feel mm-hmm. good. So that's kind of how it fell in. And my dad had always watched like the Tour de France growing up. And I'd always been like a fan of cycling. Um, but then finally one, yeah, I just, I'm like, dude, I got, I'm going to try. I took my dad's bike. I'm like, I'm going to start riding my bike. And one thing left to another. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to start racing. And here I am today, kind of just going for it. But it's been, it's one of those things. I just took it up as a hobby. And then it kind of turned into like, a pretty big chunk of my life, which when you kind of look at it, you're like, that's it's kind of crazy. That's evolved like in four years, totally four or five years. But I, yeah, I'm looking at it now. I'm like, it's, I'm thankful that that happened. Like I wouldn't, it's kind of like a really, it's a great addiction to have because I'm like, I'm in the best shape of my life, like hands down. And you see the world. And that's the thing too. Yeah. And you, not even just the world, you see your surroundings. Like it's funny getting a lot of people into it. Like a lot of my friends, like getting them into cycling, they're like, the first, one of the first um, like comments they, they have is like, I can't believe how much more you can see of your surroundings. And like you get, you're exploring every, every time you go on a ride, it's like just, cool. yeah, you're exploring. And it's like a mini little, you can look at it as like a mini little vacation or like a mini little, you're, you're traveling, right? You can see a lot, like they're amazed at like what they can see in like two, three hours on mm-hmm. a bike. Like you, you can go some pretty far places and you're like, wow, I just did that on my bike. Like you have those moments and that's, that's to me, like what it's about. It's pretty dope. I mean, running, you get a uh, running, you get a, a, a th- I think at least if not, you, you get that same kind of feeling, maybe not to the degree of like, you can go, you're not going to run a hundred kilometers from here unless you're some crazy ultra marathon runner, <laughs> which we can get on that. Like I got respect for those people, but running, you get a glimpse of that too. You can go do like a, a beautiful trail and just be, you just get lost. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I think there's something to be said for that. That, like our our culture, yeah, we need to exercise, man. We need to be in nature doing it, especially. That's what I love about cycling. Like, you know, I'm on roads, and that's why I'm trying to move a little more towards gravel, like getting a gravel bike and going in trails more. Oh, I'm uh, down for that. <laughs> that's kind of my next move. Yeah, like, and that's the crazy thing about like the cycling kind of world right now. Like, gravel cycling is the most popular thing right now. Like, people really? are moving towards that, getting away from especially if you're a road cyclist, like I got to deal with traffic yeah. all the time. Right. And worrying if I'm going to get like run over by a car. And so, he, you have so many nice fucking trails here for mountain biking, right? You got Whistler an hour and a half away. Mm-hmm. So many options. You're exactly right, dude. Mm-hmm. There's like this trail called the, I think it's the S 2 S and it's like Squamish to Whistler, all back road gravel. I just saw a couple guys I like cycle with do it. And I'm like, okay, I, I need to do this. Like I've, I've just been strictly on the road because I was always enamored by road cycling because it's like, that's the fastest you can go. Yeah. I've kind of have a couple of screws loose. I think I'm like, I want to do this. <laughs> I want to do something. I'm going to try to do it the fastest I can, I can do it. Right. So like racing on a road bike is the fastest thing you can do. So I've liked that, but yeah, the asphalt hurts when you fall and there's crashes and it's sketchy. So I want to move a bit more towards gravel riding, but we'll see how that goes. How often do you ride? Man, if I could ride every day, like I would do it. Almost every day? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Maybe this year I'd probably ride, like, if I had to ra- roughly say, like, 320 days out of 365. Wow. Really? Maybe I took, like, a month off. Couldn't get close to your, you're going every day. I love, like, that's, I probably, I want to try cycling every day. I would try that in a year. That'd be dope. But I maybe you got, kind of yeah. get fuck like, running, you can, you can run in the snow. Yeah, you 100%. cycle, when, if it snows, whatever, five days a year in Vancouver. You're kind of screwed. Well, fuck. If I get this gravel bike, man, I can go in the snow. <laughs> there's, there's thicker, it's thicker tires. I'll go in the snow 100%. Yeah. I'd be fired up. There, man, I'll show you some videos. There's some unreal cycling, like 
on snow pass with like the fat, you've just seen the fat tire bikes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, like I would love to do that one day. That's legitimately happens all the time. Like people are doing that. So fuck the snow. <laughs> Get on the bike. You should do it next year. Yeah. Like it's, I'm trying to just, man, I'll, I'll, I'm trying to push myself every year, like try new, new races, new rides. Like this year I want to try to do like a, an ultra marathon kind of uh, road bike race. Mm. So like there's one called like the Leadville 100. It's like a, it's a mountain bike race uh, in the States. And I, uh, I don't even know if I can finish it, but like something like that, like I want to just go and try it and just see where I'm at. Like, yeah. How does your body feel? My body feels <laughs> phenomenal. Like feel good. Do you, what do you do for recovery? Cause it seems like, cause you ride a long distance when you're riding your bike. Like not every time, but yeah, like there's times where, yeah, you're on the bike for like five hours and you're pretty messed up when you get off. Um, for recovery, the biggest thing is r- like rolling. Do you roll like every, after every ride? Yeah. I mean, I, tr- I'm not the best at it. Like I try, I'll definitely roll every day. Like ideally, like my trainer says, do it like every morning and every night for like 15 minutes. So I'll try to do at least that every day. Mm. And I have that, like I've probably seen that ball I have and like I have a couple of cross balls and I just, just going to town, man. And it's pain. <laughs> like it's bad. <laughs> but I honestly, it's, it's been the biggest revelation in like my, like life as being like an athlete. It's, I'm choked. It's actually, I'm like pissed off myself that I didn't do this when I was like a teenager, like STM, like playing sports. I would have loved to have been rolling out, man, like I, on a ball. I, do you think yeah, you would have yeah. fallen in love with cycling at, at STM that time in your life? Did I fall in love then? Yeah, like would you, if you were introduced to it back oh, then? Oh, man, you think if they had a cycling team. You would have done it I 100%? Would have, I would have liked to have think I would have gone for it. Like. Yeah. It's weird for me. The first kind of half of STM, I was really still like at a high level of hockey. Mm -hmm. Like, and so up to like grade 10, I was like, I'm trying to go there. Like I thought I was going to play like pro hockey. Like I was playing at like the highest level you could in BC. Like I was going for it and then had like a really bad back injury. Right. And I was, and I was out for a year and I just, for whatever reason, I didn't, I guess I was like still scared. Like I didn't go back to hockey. I don't know. It was weird. And then kind of got pulled in from like the the STM like football culture and then went back and just start playing football. <laughs> and which is like a weird, like, why would you go from that's hockey good for to like, your back? <laughs> something that's like probably worse for your back and your head. And we can get into a whole thing on that, but went to uh, played football and yeah. So it's weird. I don't know. It would have, would have cycling would fit in that. I don't even, I don't even know. I would have lo- like, if I could look back now, yeah, I would have cycled over the football part for sure. Just for like saving my, my body and my head for like the future. Cause that's kind of the thing that scares me even about like all like physical sports. Like I'll probably suffer from some of my, my concussions, which is like In kind the of future, a scary you think thing. You to, will? Yeah. I think I will. You think you had enough? I guess with hockey growing up, cause I think about that for my, I only played football only in high school for five years, Yeah, but I can count at least two or three times that I like blacked out from getting hit in the head. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. At least. I, I can probably say three times I got concussions or I thought I did at least. And tw- two times I blacked out. And Denny, that's one of those is enough, man. It's crazy. Yeah. So I, I'm the exact same thing. I have three times where blacked out like pretty quick, but like I went to back to the change room. I didn't know where my bag was. Yeah. Like I didn't know, I didn't know what day it was. Didn't like I went in the change room. I didn't know, couldn't differentiate. Like I didn't know where I got changed. How fucking scary is that? I look back at it now, dude. I'm like, your it's brain is super everything. scary, man. Like it's, yeah. cr- I think about there's, it's, it's kind of a bad, I look at it now, like I kind of cringe. One of them was, it was a Halloween night, like back when I was playing SFU university for, I was playing hockey and yeah, I, I hit a guy with my head. I was, I knocked myself out. <laughs> Apparently, like, I don't remember. I got off the ice. I went in the change room. It was at Trinity Western. Didn't, didn't know where my bag was. Nothing like, so complete, like a pretty bad concussion. And even my trainer right away, she's like, okay, well, I know it's Halloween night. Like, I know the boys are going out. Like, you shouldn't drink tonight. And like, you should have someone watch you while you sleep. Of course, that night I just got like mangled with the, with the guys, <laughs> like drank, went out. Like, I woke up the next day, but like, it could have been like, it could have been bad. Like, I look at stuff like that and I'm like, dude, I was just playing with fire. Mm. It's scary when you like, think about the times you said you got knocked out, right? Like, it's, it's not great. Like, it's not ideal. I look back, like, let's play some sports that that's less of a percentage of that happening. 
At the time, you don't think it's anything, no. though. You do, that's, and that's like, exactly it. It's one play. I remember grade nine, provincial finals at Holy Cross before I moved to STM. Yeah. Oh. And it was just like a weird... I was trying to get outside the DN, and he just kind of grabbed my jersey and like pulled me down. And like the first thing to hit my head or to hit the the turf was my head. And I just remember like blacking out for a second and seeing stars. But like I kept playing the entire game, like the rest of the game. I didn't have any memory loss or anything like that. So at the time, you just think, oh, I'm totally fine. I think you just got a stint, like you just got a stinger. You got shook out. That's what you used to say, right? Like, what about after the game? How did you feel? I think I had headaches for a couple yeah. of days, but yeah. like yeah. that was the one thing I remember from football practices. You always get headaches. I got headaches like all neck, the time, neck pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, football is a like if I ever have kids, man, they they ain't playing, they ain't playing football. Here's and a bicycle. Mom. Would you would you would you say no though? No, I would never like I mean, like it's for me. It's a hypothetical. I don't know if I'll ever have kids, but. I would never like, I would never tell, I tell myself this now. I would never tell my kid like, no, you can't do this. Kind of like let them organically come to it. I think is maybe the best. Cause I've thought about that too. And I, I, I really enjoy playing football. So did I. Yeah. And I religiously watch Seahawks games. And if I ever have kids, they're going to religiously watch Seahawks games with me. That Boom, is not an go. option for them. I'm just kidding. No, I, <laughs> but like, I assume like, Little fucking Denny Jr., three years old, watching Seahawks games with his dad every weekend, is going to just, like, like football, just and based he, on, like, that. And even what I, I look at even more about, like, team, like, we can even take that further, like, so football, even hockey for me, like, what a child can learn, what totally. I learned from mm-hmm. playing on a team. And in that, like, I would never trade that for the world. Like, that's kind of shaped me into who I am today, I think. A huge part about being on a team, playing hockey and, and football. like. Dude, you learn so much. It's kind of create like I feel bad for people that don't yeah. experience that. And I'm not saying you have to do that in sports. Like there's a team you can have in work or in the arts or what have you. But mm-hmm. so to be in some sort of team, like it's man, they they can't teach that in school. Literally, like, like it's only if you're on a team. I never that. played hockey, so I can't say anything about that. But like football versus basketball for me it was so drastically different. And in what sense? Just. Like, so basketball was more about like controlling emotion. So okay. like never getting too high, never getting too low. We're in, as in football, getting super pumped up and using that effectively is actually a better strategy, right? Than, than just like being low key. So I, I feel like it's just a different type of mentality going into a football game than what I learned through basketball. But there's still your like, and it's the same, it, it seems like that echoes hockey as well. Like there's... <clears throat> There's the highs and lows of the game, but it's like super, like when guys are fighting, like that's hmm. the ultimate, to me, that's like the right. ultimate kind of showdown, right? Like Even just like in, in Canada, football is not that big. So we get to play both offense and events. We just don't have enough athletic people in the schools. Yeah. So even just the difference and you don't really realize it as you're going through it, but the difference between like playing offense and defense oh, for like these. my positions like playing Crazy. strong safety or corner or whatever, I'm just trying to kill people, right? <laughs> like if someone is running at me, I'm trying to hit them as hard as I can. Right. And then quarterback, you're upset. like calming people down. You're right? zen. You got to be straight zen. Yeah. And you need to be like super focused, reading a defense, conductor, looking where guys are going. You're the conductor, buddy. You're running the But also symphony. like, but bringing other people down too, in terms of emotionally down. Yeah. Like bringing linemen down. Linemen are pissed because someone just punched them in the nuts. Yeah. And I got to be like, you got to relax. We're running this play next time on two. Remember, it's on two. You know, like, you got to <laughs> tell like, me that. Remember, you're telling me the yeah. play every time. <laughs> Fuck. Man, I could never. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have that much of a drastic change between a, a tight end or receiver to like, I played like nose tackle some games. Yeah. Or D end or, <laughs> or wherever. Or D end. But no, yeah. I, I like offense way, way more. Like, now that if I can look back at it, mm-hmm. offense all day. Would you say, would, what, what would you say? If you could go it's back. so different, right? On defense, you just get to be a lunatic, and that's fine. But what do you? If you can, you answer that? Like, do, could I you think say, my personality fits better. Like, I really enjoyed playing quarterback. I, th- I liked being a leader. I liked. I feel like I perform better when I'm calm. So I think. Well, I think you. I would say quarterback for you. Like you were totally. Yeah, I enjoyed it better, but at the same time, I found value even looking back at just like being able to let go of emotion on defense of yeah. course you still and still in a, a db position it's focus right 
Totally. It's different than a, like sure. a D tackle. A D tackle, literally your job every single time is just to run straight and try to tackle the running yeah. back or the quarterback. Whereas playing DB, you need to read what plays are happening. You need to adjust. You need to cover guys on re- whatever. There's just a lot more going on. 100%. But at the same time, if something's running at you the ball with the ball, your job is to murder them. To, they're going to be on the ground. Yeah. yeah. As soon as possible. Yeah. It's a little more uh, <laughs> black and white, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just different. No, but then, and then I, I, that makes me appreciate court, like again, quarterbacks, NFL, like the mental stress that those guys are going through, buddy, that's draining. Like people, I don't think people understand. I mean, it's like anything. If you haven't done it or experienced it, you don't really understand. Mm -hmm. We have a small sliver of what that's like, even playing like high school ball or whatever. Me playing special teams, SFU, Mm -hmm. like I get like a little feeling of that. And it's like, I got mad, like crazy respect, man. And for these athletes coming at you, like, oh. I get I shake in my boots a bit sometimes when I watch it. Like getting run over by like a three hundred and forty pound guy. Like you, especially next day, man. those like select handful of dudes that are the top quarterbacks in the NFL that every single time they have the ball in the fourth quarter it just seems like they win. Every time. You're right? just fucking waiting on for them to score. You just like, you know it's because happen. Russell Wilson is is number one on that list. You know I, I know where <laughs> I I see that. But I, not, I don't know about number one. He is number he is he is number one in the fourth on, quarter coming back on game winning drives. Game winning drives in the last like I'm seven pretty years sure he's number one. Yeah. I, I just saw that stat on <clears> the weekend. Obviously Brady's up there. I, f- I hate Brady, but obviously he's in that conversation. I you I used to hate Brady, but I you have to appreciate the goat, man. I understand. See, I would never call him goat. I would call him. I have to, man. I hated him. Something I said on last night's Seahawks social podcast. Do you want? Can I give you more of this? I'm going to step. Sure. I will. I understand that Brady's a good quarterback. In no circumstance ever will I say he's the greatest of all time. Ever. Yeah, that's just you got to just. But that's personal shit. (laughs) Yeah, you got to just. I'll cheers to that. I like. I like (laughs) like standing up to your to your Seahawks there. Who do you think you watch a lot of NFL? Yeah, I watch. Yeah, who's I'm, the best quarterback in the league right now? Right now, oh, I, w- I wish I could say Gardner Minshew. <laughs> when he, <laughs> that last game, especially man. can I say I just got a shout out? Who is a, that? I don't even just, know who that is. Listen, Jacksonville Jaguars legend. He's got a. I'm gonna read this one <laughs> reason I grew the mustache. No man, he had a 69.420 uh, completion percentage one week. <laughs> and have you seen what he like the off man, the he, plane? Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking yeah. about, right? It's the greatest like. Oh man, the guy's what? a walking meme. <laughs> you, you said it. He knows. This guy's a legend. Okay, so he's he's done a decent job, but no, the greatest one in in all seriousness. Uh, I'd say Jackson on on Baltimore. Oh come yeah, on, I have to. he's not even close. Danny, man. I'm sorry, dude. The intent is like, not close. What do you mean? He's gonna break Vic's record for uh, rushing yards by a quarterback. What's his position? He's a quarterback. That is correct. He's no, not the a new back. the new quarterbacks. I think in the future here, like next couple of years, they're gonna have to be able I, to run. I don't think so. Hundred percent. Able to run is different than be a running back, right? You no, know, no. He, you need to have that. I, you, okay, you so need to have that option. I went to. I have not watched. Uh, well, I watched maybe a quarter of the game against New England this week with Baltimore. But other than that, I haven't watched a second of him play. Well, other than, but hey, hold on, you're hold disqualifying on. yourself. Hold right on. away. No, no, no. You shouldn't have started with that. <laughs> I'm getting to something I'm here. Fuck with you, okay? I went to the Baltimore Se- Seahawks game. Okay, so you saw him in the flesh in Seattle. Okay, so I saw him live, and he's outrageously talented. It's ridiculous, but he's not as good in the pocket as the elite guys. Sure, he can run. He could be a Michael Vick. He could be an RG three, one of those type of guys. But he's gonna get hurt because he's so dumb when he leaves the pocket. And and you probably make a valid point there. But you said who is the best in the league right now? I think he's. He is at this moment. He's the best, man. They just beat the Patriots. I don't think he's the best. And I'll, I'll say, I think as much I as think I'm he, not a Seahawks fan, I'll, I'll get Russell Wilson is a very close second. I think to that how he's playing. I I'm think not even just saying that because you're a Seahawks fan. Like I'm not like blind to the fact that he's playing like they're playing out of their they're playing unreal. If I'm picking a quarterback for my franchise today, I think he's in the top five, Jackson. I don't know if he's in the top three. But okay, didn't but didn't I think, Russ? I, th- I Russ brought sure. that to the table that run like and I, the one thing I had against him even at the beginning of the year I'm like this fucker is not running enough. But that's what made him what he was. Man, he's he's the, he's your guy you're arguing against. Like he, if he wants to run, that guy could run. Maybe not this year, but the last couple of years, man. How last, many how many games has Russell Wilson missed in his career? 
no, you know I'm, the answer. I know the answer. Zero. <laughs> He That's, doesn't get hit. Well, he doesn't, He's so much smarter. Like Patrick Mahomes breaks his kneecap or whatever. Yeah. The Seahawks don't run QB sneaks because Russell Wilson is the most important person in the world for us. Right? Fair enough. But so for, Hand the ball off. Forgive me if I'm wrong, though. He did run a lot more. Like, let's call it three, four seasons ago. You're right, but he avoids contact so well. And that's that's on but he But he did, though, right? Like, even when they won the Super Bowl, he, did he run? I think he did because he had to. Like, that, um, would you just say this to how the, the offense was made up that year? Or what, like coming or back to Jackson, like there was three specific plays I can remember in my head where, and one of them super specifically was like in the fourth quarter it was third and six scrambles outside the pocket, get easily gets a first down, but jukes some guy to go back to the middle of the field and takes a big hit. Whereas, Whereas yeah, the Russell Wilson's you, going down, he's you. got a first down on third down. It's in the fourth quarter. Your job is to waste time. You're up by 10 at that point or whatever it was. Go down. Don't take an injury. That's experience over, over youth, I guess, at the end, like essentially, right? Like, yeah, I, <laughs> it's unless, a you're really a, unless you're really a wise player, like from a young age. It's the same thing with Mahomes. Yeah, I'd agree. Right? Yeah. He is retardedly talented, like so talented, but he doesn't know how to avoid contact yet. Yeah. And, and it's one, he's a one hit away from a like careers over. Yeah. And you hope that this now teaches him a lesson. You're right though. And, but again, Wilson, how long has he been in the league for now? He's, this is his eighth season, I think. So it's safe to say he's experienced. He's seen some shit. <laughs> but he was good at that from the beginning. Okay. And that's, and most guys don't learn it. Most guys fair. think it's their job to get three extra yards. Your yeah. job is to be the quarterback for the next 15 years. Your job is to not get three yards. So you, you don't think Jackson will have a, a long career? The way that he's playing right now, no. I'd say it's max three to four years. And even like, like, let's look at Vic. Vic didn't have a super long, like, do we know off the top of our head? Do you guys know Vic was in career? and out of lineups for probably 10 years, I want to say. Did he but ha- he did was he even, injured so much. And so did he play, like, I think he had maybe five years of like playing at that level. Would you, is that even a stretch maybe? he probably still missed games throughout those seasons because he. No, fair enough. But I'm saying like, if you can tally it all. Oh, at that level? Five seasons of like, so you're right. There's probably a lot of a shorter window for like a guy like to play that level. Maybe you're playing three to five seasons, like unreal. Yeah. And there's no way you can keep it up physically after that. Whereas you're right. Russell Wilson, like. Mahomes is probably the closest. I can't, I can't name one other person who plays that style of football. Uh, Deshaun Watson. Who? Who is, hold on, no, not that plays that style of football, but plays that style of football that's as good as Russ at okay. getting out of contact. Mm-hmm. To me, Russell Wilson sets the bar, and Mahomes is, like, the next best. But most of the guys, like RG3, like Vince Young, like those guys that I, I can't even, who else in the NFL right now? Deshaun Watson, I don't watch Tim him. Tebow he plays for the it. Houston no, Texans. No, he, but he's, he's not, but he's... Some games where he doesn't show up, but he's he's not bad as well. But he's not on Russ Wilson's level. There's no way. You see Wilson's numbers this year? Yeah, I've I've seen them, man. They're much better I, than Lamar's. But hey, I am always going to root against the Seahawks. <laughs> um, it's just in my blood, man. I don't know. Like, you're are you a Seahawks fan? See, we so we can at least relate over this. And it's nothing against you personally. Yeah, he said. I'm yes, a Chargers fan, man. Them. I'm a Chargers <laughs> fan. It's my charges, man. <laughs> I need Rivers to shut it down, though, man. He's got too many kids. He should just shut it down. Is he at nine kids or something? He's juggling. <laughs> he's holy shit. Yeah, he's got. I think he's got nine. New quarterback in there. We're coming who, after. Who? After Rivers, I don't know who. Melvin is this, Gordon. Is this is last year. No, I, I. I'm just joking. I, I have no idea. They I never liked so. that guy. Do you like him? <sighs> Not like himself. As a Chargers fan, do you have to like him? Yeah, you kind of have to. What I've loved if they kept Breeze, obviously. Like, imagine the Chargers if Breeze stayed there. Like, are we the New Orleans? Like, we have a Super Bowl possibly. I mean, you can go down hypotheticals all day. We could. Why is he such an unlikable guy? To me, I put him in the category of a Tony Romo. Like, pretty good quarterback, always going to be in the top 10. Hell of a commentator, though, now. I love. Do you like Romo's like- probably my favorite? I love John Gruden before he. But Sorry. Romo's Romo is so good, man. He's really good because he actually so, fucking understands the game. You can break exactly, it down. The X is the Y is all. He's that. been dropped like he's been everything. Yeah, that. but you're right. Like as a quarterback, Romo is hard to. But man, fuck, what an athlete, man! He's a hell of a golfer. That's why I I, I have know. a soft spot for Romo, dude. He's he's like tried to like finish in some pro events. He's, he's played on there. PGA events. Exactly. I think he's played on PGA. You know, he, on, I, he missed maybe, a cut and he missed the cut in a PGA event. I hundred percent saw that. Mm-hmm. But, but he's played on like the him. next tour, web.com, or it's called something different now. 
I love pro guys players. that can go from like if they played pro to like playing golf. Like I listen to have you heard of Spin Chicklets? Like we're talking about podcasts. Yeah. Spin Chicklets, you've heard of it? It's like the I've heard of it. I've it's the biggest it. hockey podcast okay. in the world. Uh Ryan Whitney, he's on there with like, you know, Paul Bisnet Biz Nasty is a huge kind of hockey mm-hmm. hockey name. Uh Ryan Whitney's another guy on there. He played for like uh Pittsburgh, played for Edmonton. Anyways, played in the NHL, had a good career. So he retired, but he's like, man, I still got to still gotta get the competitive juices flowing. Like, I can relate totally. So this guy's like an unreal golfer now. Like, unbelievably, he's trying to, he's trying to just go for it, man. I'm like, I can respect that so much. Like, and he's probably like late 30s, early 40s? I think he's, yeah, he's probably late, like maybe almost, he's probably not even 40 yet. Like late 30s, yeah. It's not and a, he's great, already winning, not a great like, time to start golfing. But he's, man, he, this guy shoots already like low 70s like like he's already a hell of a golfer okay i think hockey guys have an advantage dude it's crazy speaking of i'm gonna try to introduce this slowly so that i can pull up the actual numbers get it rather than making it it up mike bell one of our good friends oh mike bell's played in this turn here it is mike bell's played in this uh hawaii uh pro-am tournament four years uh three years in a row won all three years his scorecard this year, it's a, like a real live golf course, guys. Like, this is not made up. His That's scorecard true. this year was 64, 66, 61, 65. <laughs> Shot 31 under par <laughs> in a golf tournament. <laughs> that is disgusting. You know right? what? And if he had the title, it would have been even better. That's a shout out. <laughs> he, he'd, he'd like that if I said that. That is, that's disgusting. That's How are you that good at, at golf? That's tournament golf, playing it down, playing everything exactly where it is. I love what he's done, man. He, that guy's got me fired up, man. Guys, Tony Romo did not make the cut for the Safeway Open. But this was a, but it was a PGA Tour event, right? Yeah, this was like recent. Like This was Boom. end of September, so he's, he's fucking trying to make it. I think it. he got a sponsor exemption, though, <laughs> correct? But what, Maybe what he say. shot? Like, Plus I think four. He's, he's still a hell... Like, he's, I don't know, like, always fuck up the handicaps, but like, he can probably shoot like... If that guy's even shooting even at like a 70 or whatever, 71 yeah. at some of these courses, like you're in the top, what, 2% of golfers in the world? Yeah, PGA is top 1%. That, less than that, probably. I think uh, to even like get a sponsor exemption or like go into Monday qual- or Monday qualifying for yeah. your PGA tournaments, you can't have a higher handicap than a scratch. So there you go. Yeah. There you can't you just show up as like a no, like a nineteen. Just be like, hey guys, <laughs> is that what I would be? I'm gonna tee it up today. <laughs> Shoot ninety eight. Just be like, oh well, I gave it a, gave it my best. It was a good round for me. I made a birdie. <laughs> I love golf. I'm I'm I love golf because now like the rest of my life, if I if I can keep living, mm-hmm. just keep trying to chop away at it, get better. It's a, it's a slow game for me. I love it though, man. It's fucking unreal. What's your game looking like right now? I'm going into Palm Springs in two weeks. I feel pretty. You know, man. we're thirteen days away. Yeah, I feel that's a that's plenty of time. I'm not even gonna go to the that's, range. Nothing. That's plenty of time. <laughs> plenty of time for what? You're not even planning a no, practice. just just to get like loose. No, I'm <laughs> I'm feeling good, man. I I didn't play I didn't play like a lot this summer, but yeah. enough. And uh, just got to be calm out there, man. It's you want to go to the range tomorrow with me? I, I actually might be in for that. I need to okay. hit, I need to hit <laughs> a couple <laughs> balls, but maybe a warm up bucket, man. I'm like done after like 25. I'm. Balls? balls, yeah. Jesus, no, I'm kidding. I've been no. like 100 to 150 every day. For I know you're gonna Jesus. go crazy. I'm just, I'm just going out there to have a good time. It's like to me, it is. Um, That's I'm the thing. Up, man. Right? I need, I need I to move all the time. To me, it's like rela- It's a relaxing thing, but I'm moving. If totally. That sound like it to, so for me, it's ideal. Like I struggle to sit on it, like during the day, especially if it's nice or something. Like I'm, you won't see me sit on a couch. Mm-hmm. I can't do it, man. Like I might. I need to move. So for me, like to golf and I'm like, I'm still moving and I'm, I'm not like, I don't, it's not a crazy workout, mm-hmm. but it's tiring still. It's, that's kind of how I look at it. And also just to get to go away with you guys, like to play. Uh, and I love the mental like struggle is totally. probably the ultimate. I, I've never, I won't, don't know if I'll ever master that, but to, it makes you mentally stronger. I think if you can start to, to get better at golf, cause that's what it takes, man. It's, I don't think anyone's mastered it. I think the best golfers in the world. Even look at like a Woods, right? It's look at what out. happened in the Masters this year. Exactly. So even I, I was What's his name? A- Molinari. Do you remember that? The Italian Stallion, <laughs> Molinari. 
Fuck, he had a hell of a year. Molinari well, was right. up by four, I think, and put two balls in the water on the back nine on Sunday. Just goes to show, man. It's the ultimate uh, mental, like to be the mental strength. I think it's got to be number one, if not in the top, like three. It's it's up there, man. It's such a. You don't play golf at all, do you? It's such a funny sport. Like, I can't tell you the amount of times that I hit a perfect tee shot off the first tee, straight in the middle of the fairway, 320, and you're just like, this is going to be a good day. And then you shoot. And you fuck that shot like, up, right? And then I shoot like 88. <laughs> and then the next day, I'll hit like a big slice. I'll be underneath a tree, punch out, make a double bogey on one, and shoot 73. Or not, maybe not that good, but maybe like 78. It's just so stupid. And I love to see Danny get fired up on the course. It gets oh me fired God. up. Have you seen me break a club? I've seen you get pretty fucking angry, man. I snapped probably the vice five versa. I'm pretty... Over the knee or what? I try not to get... Uh, no, I chucked it at a tree and it just bent and snapped. I've <laughs> thrown... <laughs> you see, I've thrown a club and just left it. I've, it's gone. I, I don't have my two hybrid anymore because <laughs> she was tossed and I was pissed. But now I'm a lot... You, know, you just got to get Zen out there and enjoy it, man. That's Mike... It. So Mike has... His mental game has gotten so much better in the last couple of years. I love to hear that. A few years ago, Mike intentionally put an extra, you can't have, uh, I think it's 14 clubs you're allowed to have, so you can't have 15 clubs. So he puts a stick in his golf bag so that when he's pissed off, because he gets pissed off almost every round, he throws (laughs) the stick in the water instead of a golf club, which is brilliant. Or he'll snap the stick stick over his knee. Brilliant. And it's worked for him. He doesn't do it anymore. And I don't think he did it in tournaments, but like he did this in practice rounds all the time. I, I know him. He's got a bit of a, he's got the fiery. Oh, he's so feisty. I, I love it. Yeah. But yeah, you need like that needs to be like pushed aside if you're going to pursue what he's doing. Like any, like he's trying to be a pro, right? Or he's a pro. How many defensive, let's say, how many linebackers and strong safeties do you think transition well to golf? Probably not many because as we were talking about before, their their mentality is just kill people. It's all or nothing. <laughs> yeah, totally. Look at a lot of offensive. I, that's a funny. Comp- I wonder if that's the same for hockey too. Like this Whitney Ryan Whitney guy I was talking about was like yeah. a was a puck moving defenseman, like more yeah, offensive minded. Uh, totally skilled guy. Skill guy, yeah. and that you maybe does that always transfer over? Like there's a lot of hockey guys that are unreal at golf too. Like it's just there's there is a it's pure like the natural off season sport for hockey guys right but you know what fucks me up though is the guys that shoot like left in hockey and shoot right in golf right i have a couple friends that do that i will never understand this i don't care about the biology any of this it, that is fucked up i don't know how does that. that work how are you taking a great slap shot like in this motion and you don't think that the golf is going to come yeah. to it, but these fuckers are doing it the opposite way because the power is coming from the other side of your body now. That's bizarre. And have I, they tried golfing the other way? Dude, one of my friends, uh, my buddy Matt, can he is a, like a, he was a hell of a hockey player, and he's a solid golfer, and he's a left hand shot hockey, right hand <laughs> golf. So weird. And he can't, but I, I, he can't do golf the other way. I, I don't understand don't understand that, that right? That's it's one of those really weird ones for me, man. That I don't I don't quite get. You are left and everything. I'm left and left, yeah. Except for like soccer, I'm right footed. That's I'm, even weird. I'm right footed. Me too. I'm exactly the same way. Yeah, right footed, but like yeah. uh, hockey is and golf. Le- I'm a left hand. That doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. How does that happen? What foot do you jump off of? I would jump off my. Ooh, I'll jump off my left foot probably actually. Because for me, it's my right. Usually, you jump off your opposite. What? My off uh, foot. Like I can throw down better with my left hand. Really? That's weird. Yeah. But you're right-handed. Yep. See, I, I've never been able to dunk, so I can't. Re- I can't. <laughs> I can't really. What uh, foot do you throw down off of first? Shit, man! I don't throw down at all. Buddy. I was all about layups, man. <laughs> hey, we we played uh, high school H to oh HC. Oh my god, Holy Cross, Holy baby. Cross! But it had a Jordan headband. I think baby blue, if I remember. Iverson's on the and one money, money mids or whatever. Yo, remember the and ones with the swirl, like the half swirl yes, with the velour. Yep. I had those, man. The Tracy oh, McGrady's nice. came out. Dude, yeah, we played, man. All, and our, our whole team, all we did was just pass, pass sibs, man, all day. <laughs> just a bunch of hockey players and me. <laughs> you fucking dominated, <laughs> if I recall, right? Like, that was... Yeah, dude. I don't dude, know. we go way... seven? Yeah. So we go back to... We've known... So we're, what, 30 this year? Have you yeah. turned... When's your birthday? I'm 30. March. March. You're, so you're already... Th- like, dude, we probably know each other 20... Say, say maybe 24 years. Easy, yeah. 25 Since years. Since kindergarten, right? Since kindergarten. It's pretty nuts, man. 
It's a long time. I wanted to bring that up. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta bring that up. That's a, <laughs> it's a long time to know someone. Like Especially I, when you're 30. When we like. <laughs> a lot of people are super surprised that I still talk to people that I went to high school with. Like, that's a big thing. But and I fucking elementary school. <laughs> and I, but I always like, I, I just embrace that. I'm like, that's dope, yeah. right? Like, right. Mm-hmm. I there's, think it just says a lot about. There's a reason. Yeah, 100%. And, but I also, I see the people that kind of, they are, man, I already see from like 20 years old to 30, I'm a way different person. Totally. So I can understand like the people in high school, like, if you completely change and you had to go do your thing, wherever that, wherever that takes you, I can understand that as well. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's, to me, that doesn't like phase me really, but it's cool to hear mm-hmm. people like compliment that, but I can see the whole, the 180 of that as well. It's so right? unique. I think our friend group, and I'd l- love to be m- like more a part of it. It's just like the last few years have just been so busy with work that I come out to one thing a month maybe, but I know you guys hang out a lot more. But our friend but not, group, but is, not even on that. Like it's it's maybe almost not in a, recently. once a month now. Yeah. Even yeah, but it's just more just like note. there's ten of us, so maybe it's just like every birthday. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? it is. Yeah, yeah. it's and even it, or so it's, now people are just having kids. So yeah, me and you don't have to worry about that for a while. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Anyway, I got a lot of shit to do until uh, <laughs> I I possibly have a child. Yeah. I I'm just trying to take care of myself right now. <laughs> It's pretty unique though. A lot of people I talk to or meet have met in the last few years talking about like, oh, I got a high school friends party tonight or something like that. And they're just like, you hang out with high, yeah, high right? school friends? Like, yeah, we see each other like once a month-ish. Hey, I just, it's a lot of like-minded people um, mm-hmm. and you kind of want, you're, you just stick together, right? Even, like you our can school, still do your same, you can still do your own thing too though. Our school is a bit unique, but I think the group that we had in our grade was just very unique we're lucky as well school. right yeah it it is rare man like i i have a, like friends from Notre Dame where there's still like a couple of them that are tight but like other than that i don't see it's not usually that big of a group though you're it's right like a man. few people and they and, you, and it's cool to start seeing as we get older you get you know wiser you start seeing things and you see how certain people are growing their life or mm-hmm. having yeah kids like you said family mm-hmm. other people going on different paths like it's it's cool to see man i'm, I'm just trying to embrace it trying to do my thing and it's it's cool though they're, they're having the kids though like the friends having that like i don't think it's really hit me yet because i can't fathom it it's mm-hmm. one of those things that i'm so removed from that i just kind of like i don't know i don't even really think about it a lot but it's been a lot of weddings in the last like that's six years yeah yeah we got rust we got one more like next yeah the weddings is a i've been at a lot of weddings man <laughs> Shit. I wouldn't recommend doing it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, no. I, uh, <laughs> you're not, you know, you're not having to, <laughs> to, to convince me over here, buddy. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I'm not, and I'm not getting married anytime soon, if ever. I got, I got some other shit to do, buddy. Is some it a weird to thing see. to see your fr- friends starting to have kids? I, I mean, maybe weird's the wrong word. It's just, yeah, it's just different for me. Like, it's not. So I look at it, and then you, I think it's natural for any human being to like. So you look at a friend or someone you know, and then you kind of like, you compare naturally in a way, right? Like, yeah. so what are they doing and what are you doing in your life? I don't try to, I don't say that I do that all the time, but you kind of, I think, subconsciously do that. Yeah. And so when that happens, I'm like, oh, well, there's nothing for me to compare. Like, I'm on my own. I kind of see where I'm going, and then like, and people are kind of sticking to, you can call it a traditional way of life or whatever they, you know, having kids and being married, whatever. And all power to you. If you're happy, I'm fucking so happy for you. Mm-hmm. But I don't. So yeah, is it weird? Because I don't see my life like going that cookie cutter, like marriage, kids route. Um, and so for me, it is weird, I guess, because I ain't doing that. So, and I'm super, I'm happy. So I've I think just, there's many ways to do this fucking thing we call life. Totally. And I don't know what, and we could all be wrong or all be right and we'll never know because yeah, we're all I've just been surrounded by kids since I was like 12. Like my family just pumps out kids like... I'm going to pour this while you say this. What's the right analogy? I don't know. Pumps out kids like Ferrari rides kilometers. It's an (laughs) abundance. It's fucking new day, new kid. Here we go. Let's do this thing. Do you think that affected you though? That like you... 
I like, I don't feel uncomfortable around kids. It doesn't make me feel weird. Like my original question was, but it's more just, I've never, I've been surrounded by kids forever, but I've never felt ever that I've been ready to have a child. And that's just, you know, it's what? more, I think for me, it's more just that I'm not willing to give up my current lifestyle yet. I not give up more, more just like alter. I'm not willing to give alter it yet. And that's, it's awesome that you can um, be, first of all, like self-aware. Like I think self-awareness is a like an underrated yep. thing that no one talks about. 100%. So first of all, to be self-aware enough to to like know that that's kind of where you're heading, what you want, we can go down that road, but that's the first thing that's huge. And then to just be like, well, fuck, to be cool with that and not mm-hmm. fall into pressure. and Because, dude, like culture will pressure you, your family, your friends any external force will pressure you Mm -hmm. in some way, whether it's positive, negative, we can, you know, whatever, but it's just, you got to just ride out your kind of, however you feel, man. And it's fucking hard just to kind of go on that path. But, uh, is that something that you talk about with like friends, family, or is it just something in your head that you're like, I see people's lives going this way. I feel like mine needs to continue on this path. I think I've always organically kind of had, a bit of that, like it, mm. I've, whatever you want to call that, like your inner voice or whatever. I've always mm. had it in my mind, but then I don't think it's never like a bad thing to have friends that you can bounce that off of. Mm. Right. So I do have a couple like close friends like that. I can, yeah, we, we talk about these kind of things. Right. And, uh, it's cool to see someone's on the same wavelength as you. It's also, even if no one was, I think I would still kind of go on that path. Cause mm. I, I'm just trying to find the balance in my life. Like, be happy, mm-hmm. be cool with what I'm doing. Like, I'm just trying to fucking suck everything out of this life, man. <laughs> Do you have moments of like second guessing? Yeah, I think it's natural. Yeah, I, I probably, I do. It's, I think it's natural to kind of have that, but then I also just fucking toss that out like as soon as I can, mm-hmm. because like, I fucking can't do anything about it, man. Like, what am I going to, yeah, I have regrets, whatever, but they're like, they're gone now because I can't change that. So it's just like, I don't know what I'm, I'm going to live in the moment and make every kind of day or every second, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to make that better or more aligned to what I kind of want. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's a natural thing though to, to have regrets and look back. I want to do this different, this, but I try to now like in my mindset, push that out of the way right away. And like, let's just move forward and be better, be like, change that, whatever, whatever it may be. Right. mm -hmm. I don't, you know. Depends I think a lot of people you. dwell on that stuff though. That's yeah. On like whether it's a regret or like second guessing a decision or whatever. I feel like that's something that I really like about myself is that those thoughts come up all the time, literally 100%. daily, hourly. They're always there, but the ability to push them away, I think is unique. hundred percent, man, for sure. You're not like every, any human being that's, you're going to get, you're going to get that all coming at you, but you're right to push that away and just, you just got to keep going, man, because you get, you'll get bogged down every day. Every day. It's kind of overwhelming if you're like, if you fall prey to all that shit, man. Like I just, I don't know. As I get older, I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks about me. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Um, if like my life isn't leading up to maybe what you thought it might, like whether you're like in my, even in, like, it might sound ruthless. Like even what my family thinks, like, dude, mm. I just got to, at the end of the day, dude, you got to be happy. Yeah. You got to live your life. Because um, so many people put themselves in situations just so they look good for their family, right? 100%. But then they're fucking Fuck, unhappy. Man, dude. So I, we, I'll, it's, I love that you said that because <laughs> quickly. So I was on that path, man. When I was, I thought I had to go to fucking law school. That was the way I my life should have been, man. Like I didn't see you as a lawyer from the beginning, to dude, be honest. So, but that's <laughs> I. I felt the family pressure. Like you can go into. It's not even I think just Italian families. Like just. Yeah, even maybe that's what it was, but I felt the pressure. Like, yeah, you got to be successful, have a family, do this, blah blah blah. Like, you can go the fucking on that CV. We can see that whole resume that you'd want, right? <laughs> so you know, you're on your way out of high school. Like, I'm accepted into law school. I'm like, fuck, this is what I got to do, man. And for whatever reason, I had like an epiphany, change of heart, whatever. And I'm like, fuck this. Like, I kind of looked at like where I wanted my life to. Like, okay, where am I going to be in like a couple of years? Like, what's it going to look like? And I'm like, yeah, no, fuck that. Like, 
quote unquote nine to five, like working my ass off. But yeah, probably making bank, like good money. But I I was lucky enough, I think, like traveling really changed me to realize early that money wasn't like the goal and mm-hmm. what I should be chasing and what culture thinks you should be chasing is mm-hmm. like the money. Mm-hmm. But I kind of got, I did, but I also fell out of that. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to be a lawyer and then I'll kind of see where it goes. Whatever. Long story short, I just, I'm like, fuck it, man. Didn't do that. Did you get any pressure from the people that you thought were putting pressure on you? No, but I felt it was still, well, like a bit, like my dad kind of like, I think he kind of like inadvertently maybe was putting pressure on me for that. Mm -hmm. I still think he would be happy with me not doing that I, for me it was weird too like you're battling like self-esteem stuff too like yeah i put my whole childhood was like again play hockey mm-hmm. be a professional i failed at that i kind of this i had days where i looked at that and i'm like mm-hmm. fuck like i failed at that so it's like and you think that's what i probably my dad probably wanted that too like we're talking he was spending like i look at it now like i'm going on a tangent here but he was spending like crazy money for me like grade nine i was like barely at school like we were traveling the states and canada like playing Mm. um like shit like that and i'm like you put a lot into that i fail and so it's like okay the next thing well i'm pretty smart i can i'm doing pretty well in school like i'll go towards that route where i can be successful in that way and then i say fuck it to that like did i fail again at that and like so i kind of look at my dad and but like like kudos to him he didn't really he just wanted me to be happy if i'm successful in whatever way that is Mm -hmm. um so i didn't really feel i thought i felt that pressure from him but it never was like like right to my face like you need to go to law school in this but i i felt it from my family and stuff like being successful Mm -hmm. thinking i need to make money or like a lot of money so yeah i did feel that but thank god i kind of um like i think i like overrode it at the end of the day with like my experience from traveling i'd say Mm -hmm. especially is what Where, kind of, do you think that pressure just came from yourself then? Like assuming that other people wanted you to do these things? I Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty decent insight. Like again, talking about comparing, like mm-hmm. you see what people in your friend's circle are doing or even peers mm-hmm. or even just other people. Um, it's so easy to compare to that, mm-hmm. like, compare yourself, right? So at the end of the day, yeah, was it probably coming from me? Yeah. And that goes down to like back to where I'm at today, like, I don't give a fuck about any of that shit anymore, even to the point where maybe I'm not even as like ambitious as I once was, but to push myself is now like in cycling, like something that like physically I can mm-hmm. get better at. And I think at the end of the day, that's just making me better because I'll be healthier because of it and maybe hopefully live longer and experience this life in like a different way than yeah. like vice versa. Right. I, I think people just use the term ambition in the wrong way. Yeah. It's always, it's always towards like a professional goal usually right whereas ambition should be towards what what makes you happy what makes you happy or better cycling every day exactly improving your times or just being outside and cycling five days a week that makes you happy okay great that's my ambition that's my goal for next year is to cycle five days a week because that makes me happy right or like if you want to take it down to like the bare form like wake up that day what's like beneficial to you what's going to make you live that day in like the best possible way for you. Mm-hmm. Like you've, you've made it, man. And then, okay, next day, let's do it again. Mm-hmm. That's how I try to like, yeah, I don't, I, 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 not a big like planner, like looking into the future. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen next year, but I like to live like that. That mm-hmm. doesn't work for everyone. Um, but for me, it's like, it's very liberating because I need that freedom um, to say, okay, fuck, let's go here. I'm going to do this and I'm trying to tailor my life to like be like that for the rest of my life, like with work. So it's flexible enough that I can just like fuck off whenever I want mm-hmm. and um, not be tied down where I can just fuck off whenever I want. Right. Like <clears throat> it's kind of, this is kind of what I'm trying to build. Basically you want to fuck off whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say it the third time. I, I thanks that you, I appreciate that you finished it off, but yeah, I don't know if that made sense, but yeah. that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Um, and that works for me. That's me being happy. I don't even know what the fuck happy means. It's just being, just living, man. Like, like I said, just sucking every ounce out of this life. That's all I know that I, like, that's all I want to do right now because, and whatever it is, experience, like things I've gone through, like even in the last couple of years, whatever that have made me 
realize that even more, mm-hmm. but it's always kind of been there. But um, that's kind of what I'm after. I love having these day. conversations because the that idea in your head is so different than mine, but I think mine has been evolving. But like the last few years, even as like a teenager, my goal was always like freedom in the future. Okay. It wasn't like do what I want today. It was like do all the things necessary to have freedom eventually. When is eventually? I have no idea. Could be 40, could be 45, could mm-hmm. be 60. I, I Like I don't know. But I feel like I've made short-term sacrifices so that long-term I can fuck off whenever I want. And that's, yeah, that's unreal. But it's so different. But at the same time, I'm 30, you're 30. You've had so much more world cultural experience than I have. Like it's, it's ridiculous. And I want to experience a bunch of that. I don't know if I ever want to go to, what did you say, Mongolia? Uh, Bolivia. Bolivia. Yeah. I don't know if I ever want to go to Bolivia by myself and stay in hostels. <laughs> like hostels probably isn't my thing. Yeah. Mongolia. <laughs> I, don't I know, would whatever. love to go there too, but <laughs> see, well, whatever you pulled me out there. Yeah. Lots of hills. But like, I, know I don't see myself as a hostile person. Okay. Yeah. Just cause they scare me really. Yeah. Hey, but I want to travel more. I want to see more of the world. I want to experience more culture and I want to have that freedom. I'm not there yet, but my goal was always like build something so that I can go away stress-free. Cause right. in my head, if I go away, whatever, when I'm 21, don't really have a career set up, don't really have a whatever, don't have a home that I own or whatever the personal goals are, and I go away, it's almost anxious that I'm spending money without having money. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, not, why? Well, and I'm, I'm trying to, to get over what that. you mean, but no, you're, yeah, I guess I was just fortunate enough not to. I almost envy your mindset, but I just can't get myself there. And Even now, yeah. like, I'm like, obviously much more financially successful than I was seven years ago or For whatever. Sure. But even now still, like it's almost like, I don't think I could possibly take three to four weeks off and go away and turn off my phone because I'd be way too anxious. Interesting. And e- so you even had that feeling when we were like in your early twenties? Yeah. Really? Like for me early, like so traveling was always something I wanted to do. And I'm, not that I've done a lot. I've done like a handful oh, of done. countries in Europe. Yeah. And last year, where the hell did I go? Barbados. <laughs> well, you know, you've seen some. Like, Which is yeah. cool. But like, I'm not doing it hostile wise. Like, and that was never my goal. I don't know where I'm going with this. But no, I was asking you, like, even in your early, like, like, let's say out of high school, you mm-hmm. never had that. It's just, I'm interested that you felt like you had like a pressure not to be able to go away for a period of time just to like, Go explore, man. Like you're young. Like where people mm-hmm. always say, and I hate this like statement that people always say, but you know, travel while you're young. It's the only chance you kind of have. But you never even felt that you had like time off. Like no one was going to judge you. Nothing. Like you could just fuck off and go travel. And I don't think it was exterior pressures. I think it was just myself putting pressure on just, myself. Okay, like, on me. Interesting. Being like, I want to say that I des- almost. I want to say that to myself that I deserve this. That gotcha. I deserve to take a month off, rather than just being like. Just finished school. I have six hundred dollars in my bank account. Might as well go spend it. You know. So that was me. More like I was like I'm going to use whatever I have at my disposal right now mm-hmm. to to travel and like not go to school, not work at mm-hmm. that time. It was like because I I guess I just I I went away my uh, second year like after I quit football. I had never traveled since I did like the grade 10 trip, uh, Greece and Turkey. We, you know how they did those like two week spring break trips. Mm -hmm. That was like my first taste of like actual traveling. Like I'd never been to Greece or Turkey. So that was, that kind of was the initial, I think spark. Yeah. But again, it was like with a school, with a high school, you're obviously very sheltered. Anyways, got a, got a glimpse of it. But then I was getting pissed off by like, it was not until I was 20 years old, where I had never been to Italy, like where my family's from. And I'd always felt like that deep connection going like I was a history major like I was always a, like enamored by my culture because luckily you know fortunately enough there's a long culture there's a culture to be there to to appreciate so I was lucky enough kind of pulled into that but I was like dude my family never brought me to Italy when I was you know in my teens so I got fucking pissed off when I was 20 years old and I said fuck it I'm going by myself and I went for three weeks I never traveled on my own nothing like I look at this now and I'm like that's pretty crazy what i did like i just bought a north face backpack 
packed that shit with clothes and I told my dad, which was dope. I was just living with my dad at that time and he was cool enough to be like, okay, go do it. And I went by myself for three weeks and went to Italy. And on that trip, I saw where my like grandfather was born and where he like worked in his little town crushing olive oil. So they used like a, they used a horse to go around this pulley system that would then, cause he lived on, there was like, I don't know, probably like 500 olive trees below where he lived. Mm -hmm. So they'd pick the olives, go there and they'd use this system to crush with the horse. They would crush olives into olive oil and they would sell that. <laughs> He'd have to go on a donkey and walk with it with like for like 40 kilometers, like up to the next town and sell it. And that's the only money he made. And so I got to kind of like retrace the steps with him while he was there. And he like, he ended up passing away like two years after that, which was crazy that I got to see. He showed me how he grew up. Anyways, that like long story short, that pretty much changed my life from there. I like look back at it now and I'm like, that was a kind of like point where I was like, it just did something to me, man, where I was like seeing how they grew up, what they came from, and then to like come to Canada and give me the opportunity to like do what I was doing at that point. It kind of like blew my mind. I was like, fuck, like, and also was like, okay, I gotta, I had this mentality that I have now where I'm like, I gotta suck everything out of this life because mm -hmm. not that I, like, I, I knew I had to work hard and like, go to school and do all this. But I'm like, I want to live. I was guess lucky enough to have the mentality. Like you said that maybe you didn't have, like, I was like, I'm just going to go after this man. And then from there it was go to school and travel as much as I can between that. So that was from like the end of the semester from like May. I remember I would time it like the exam would end and I was fucking gone the next day, but I'd been working part-time like through the year. Like I was working at an auto body shop. My cousin's, mm -hmm. My cousin's auto body shop. I, I was that. making, like, I wasn't making great money, but I was making enough where it's like, I have a bit of my own money and I'm going to fuck off right when the semester ends. And I would come back the week it started because I knew you didn't <laughs> have to go to the classes. Remember, you used to get your, just, you used to get the syllabus. You'd go to the first week, they'd give you the syllabus. I'm like, this is a joke. I'll get the syllabus online. It was would, an egregious week of classes. You're exactly right. So I would skip that first week. So I would be able like, uh, there's two summers where I pulled it off from like end of May to September, like almost, you know, three full months and just backpack. And those I think are like the form of like years of my, like kind of, yeah, like post high school life, hmm. like traveling with like Rusty and Ad, like all, and I'm lucky enough to have friends that were doing the same thing. Totally. And wanted to do that. I don't know where it comes from. And the yeah, only was, thing that comes to mind for me is like just having ultra conservative parents where like everything is sheltered and that for me is almost like I need to build independence. I need to build some wealth so that I can do whatever I want rather like the idea of just backpacking and staying in hostels to me wasn't even a thing. And you, I think you, you touch on something there. I think you're right because for me it, it was probably like a, it was me being rebellious in a way. Cause like mm -hmm. I, my parents split up. Mm -hmm. I was kind of even on my own, like through my teens, like living with my dad, but didn't have my mom there. Like, so you can go into that's probably part of what led me to my mindset. Right. Mm -hmm. Like just rebelling, like, well, I'm just going to go travel and be on my own and being allowed to do that too, which is kind of crazy. Right. Yeah. Like my, I didn't have my mom really say nothing to me. I didn't have my dad say much. I just checked in. It was pretty crazy, like, what they let me, like, I was going fucking to some crazy places, like, at, like, 21, 22, and they weren't saying nothing. And I wouldn't even talk to my parents for, like, weeks. I got a piece so bad. You can keep No worries. Yeah. I kind of, that's the first time I've actually kind of thought of that, too. That's kind of, like, I, I did, like, uh, like, Croatia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania, like, just on my own. And, like, back before cell phones, like, no Google map, nothing. Dude, that's so crazy. Did you, did you ever get lost or have any sketchy situations that kind of, yeah, like there was a cut, like not like, thank God, like nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, some points where I'm like in Albania, I was a bit like, Hey, this is a weird situation. <laughs> probably should get myself out of this. <laughs> um, like funny stories too, with like, uh, I don't know if we ever, I ever told you the one about me and ring, like me and Justin got like on this train ride from uh warsaw to kiev yeah so from so from your yeah. home country from poland to to ukraine dude it was like a 22 hour train ride jesus and we had like a drug smuggling ring go through our train no way yeah 
What happened? Dude, so okay. just a bunch of sketchy guys. Long story short, we're on a train ride. Like we, it's the three bunk, uh, three bunks in yep. each carousel. Mm-hmm. Justin's on the bottom bunk. I'm on the middle. A vacant, random vacant top, vacant top bunk. Okay, vacant until you know how people get on at new stops. So you know we're, I think we're like eight hours into this trip. I'm fucking tired. Like I'm just chilling. We're sleeping. We had played cards. We're drinking. This chick walks on with a garbage bag oh, into our into God. our carousel. And I'm like, dude, this is, it already seemed weird or whatever. You don't think much of it. And then, uh, again, I'll, I'm going to cut this, I'll like truncate this story. But before you know it, she is, I'm telling like this, oh, you know the story. Yeah. Um, she starts pulling out tools and she is undoing the no ceiling way. of our carousel. What? And I'm in the bed and Justin's in the bed. I'm looking down at him and we're both like deer in the headlights. I can't do anything at this point. It's just like embrace the situation. He's, we're both tripping out. So she's pulling out stuff. And then you see the packets of like, I think to this day, they were just smuggling cigarette cartons, Oh, okay. but it was like big cartons, but they were also duct tape. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It was like big cartons of cigarettes. It looked like, and they were, and then, so she stuffs them in the top, puts it all back and then sits in like the seat that was in the carousel. We go, and this was on before the border of Poland and Ukraine. So again, we get to the border. And, and so the best part, she looks over at Justin at one point and she's like, shh, like doing this <laughs> because she's at like eye level with him and I'm not really. So right. I'm trying to ignore the situation and trying to like laugh at it. But also I'm like, I'm shitting my brick. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen here. So she does that to him. And then I'm like, dude, we can't do anything. We get to the border. Fucking the dog, like dogs come on. Like the, the customs come on our train and we're thinking like, I don't know what to do. You're fucked. You're in. Oh my God. I'm like we're done, dude. Like whatever they're smuggling here, like they're going to fucking maybe pin it on me. Right. Two guys and one girl, right? Like, so all that's going through your mind. Yeah. I can't do anything. Like looking back at it now, I don't really remember what I was going through, but it, I was shit in my pants. Dogs come through like nothing happens, man. Like it all goes fine. We get to the next stop. So you didn't snitch. I didn't snitch, but nice. I, <laughs> I watched enough. Uh, what is this? This is 50. You know, that yeah, website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was on that enough when I was young. <laughs> um, don't snitch. Get to the next, the next stop. And of course, I kind of figured at this point, I knew what was going on. So she's going to start undoing the shit and get it out. She smuggled whatever from Poland into Ukraine. Gets it out. Is off the train. I actually see with my own eyes. Because at this point, I get off the bed and I go like, you can peek your head like into the hallway. Yeah. We remember, I, you can ask Justin too, we see a guy come on the train with like a wad of like euros and like pays the conductor off. Why? I see this with my own eyes. It happens. The people get off the train and we're on our way. Nothing else happens to Kiev. And I just witnessed that. And I'm like, that was a story. People probably aren't going to believe that, but I fucking lived through that. Like that was, and it's a great story now. Me and Justin, like we got fucking hammered that night, like <laughs> laughing about it. <laughs> But dude, that could have easily gone like the other way. Mm -hmm. And that was just like a random day in going into Kiev. And I was like, yeah, you just learn like from that, like experiences like that. I'm like, that fucking did something to me because hell of a story, but scary too, man. But then after that, you're just like, that makes you that much stronger. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think like an anecdote of what traveling can do for you, right? Like you're just thrown into these situations. You made a good point, actually, as I re- went away. <clears throat> Technology. So, like, you started traveling when phones weren't a thing. There's no Google Maps. Still lucky. I couldn't even imagine doing that stuff. So, like, it, how do you... Literally, any time I ever go away, all I'm doing is on my phone, like, okay, I want to go see this. Where's the map? And Google Maps is unreal with that right now. So good. And I, it's, I love that you brought that up because I noticed myself as a traveler in 2019 is fucking way like lazier or I don't have to do as much work as it was in 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I remember me and Justin were still trying to print off uh, like MapQuest. Yes. (laughs) MapQuest. I used to do that. When we rented a car, like we rented a car in Sicily, we drove Sicily. I didn't fucking even like really plan it out. Like we tried to like roughly plan it out. Buddy, now I go on Google. Like I was doing this a couple of years ago. Direction, just following the GPS. Oh, fucking beautiful. But- (laughs) Also, I'm a bit choked at that. Like you, I think you also lose a lot of the experience. Hmm. 
Like, because in your situation with no technology, you kind of have to go into the town and talk to people, right? Dude, 100% I was forced. Yeah. Like we pulled up in this place in Sicily, I remember. We were lost. And the guy, this is like some random Italian dude. I'm like, we don't know where we are. Like we might have to, st- we had to stay the night there. And we told him we're from Canada. And right away he's like, Toronto Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, Forza Raptors. And I think uh, at that point we had an Italian on. It was like... um there was an Italian on the Toronto Raptors. It was Andrea was it Bargnani. 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 Yes. <clears throat> Bargnani was on the team. I swear to God. We, and we fucking, we came together over that, man. We broke bread over, like, he was fired up. He's like, he, I think he had family in Montreal or Toronto, of course, like any Italian. Like, <laughs> most went to Canada or the States. So, we bonded over that. But that was an example where I would have never rolled out to that, onto that guy's place, like, off the highway. Um, if it, like, Google Maps, I would have known where I'm going. So it's going to take some of those experiences away from traveling. Don't get me wrong. But I also think the like accessibility that it gives you uh, in traveling, it kind of, to me, it balances it out because you can still seek those. Like there's no excuse to not seek those, like just go off the beaten path. Like I won't even use Google maps. Sometimes I'll just get lost in places because that's how you'll still find like an authentic way to get into the culture or the country or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, there's a time to use the technology and there's a time to toss it, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be said for anything. Right? Like, and so that's how I kind of want to move forward traveling. And it's, it's funny how you almost, dude, it's weird how life works. Like how, however much technology makes everything better, I want to get away from it now. And I like, I think it actually enhances your life getting away from technology. It's, it's a weird paradox. Like it's an irony, right? Of, of growing up and, we're so lucky that we lived, I think we're the last, we can honestly yeah. say we're the last age. We can brag about this. Like I, we grew up still with like flip phones, like not being on that shit when we were young. Like I still played hockey in a cul-de-sac. Like, well, we yeah. finished high school with no data, right? Data didn't exist back then. We just Straight had those up. Nokia Facebook fucking- Facebook was just coming on in grade yeah. 12, YouTube, right? yeah. First year university. Yeah. Was, was, I think I remember that correctly. I thought it was grade 11. I remember I had Maybe, my first... It was 2006, I'm pretty sure, so and, grade 11. Grade, and Nextopia, I think it was grade like 11. we were still using yeah. Nextopia. I MySpace. Remember, like, oh, that's where I got the... Yeah. Oh, MSN man. Messenger. I remember MSN ICQ. Messenger. ICQ. Remember ICQ? Oh, I remember it all, man. That yeah. was my... Pri- like, I was in the prime <laughs> then, man. So, so it is it is an interesting paradox, right? Like, it's getting... Technology is getting better, but I want to use it less. Do you and, think we we luckily are growing up in like the best generation ever? I, thus far the, the reason being like art my parents i can speak for my parents and a lot of people that are like 60 plus they just don't get it they don't understand technology they're not open-minded enough yeah. to learn it they just want to eliminate all of it from their our, their lives and anyone that's using technology is the devil yeah and that yeah whereas we were i had my first cell phone in grade 11 we got our foot in both right? in both kind of ends of that right like we're well, I, I so we were young enough to understand that this is the way the world's going and we need to understand and adopt and change. And it was yeah. steps for us, right? For sure. Mm-hmm. But we also, maybe you more than me, remember and understand how crazy different life was without it. Yeah, no, that's, I had a funny thought, like, and, and Mr. Olson's like tech class wasn't really helping us like too much. <laughs> I don't know why I just thought of that, but <laughs> and, oh yeah, and J.R. Davies teaching us <laughs> economics. Uh, I remembered but, something so funny the other day that me and Carl were in an infotech class, <laughs> like trying to teach us computers yeah. from Brother Bassett. Brother Bassett was probably 64 at the time. Like, dude, you could write a comedy sketch about that. Yes. Like, dude, an old Christian, like monk, essentially <laughs> trying to teach you about Code. the cutting edge of coding or like where tech is going. Right? Literally like, HTML. Yeah. And every class I would ask Carl, I'd be like, what does HTML mean? Is <laughs> like, that the dude, same as Hotmail? Open your notepad. I, I, I would literally ask that though. Oh yeah. Because even if you could go back then, you would have been all over that shit if you knew how, like the power of technology. Exactly. Now. But dude, kids these days, they're just given a touch screen. They're given a laptop. They don't fucking figure out how this came to be. And that's why going back to being mm-hmm. fortunate, like lucky art, mm-hmm. I think it is the best. That, because even I remember even beginning of university, still having to like work harder to find this information not like wikipedia was still coming up then mm. like that and all this shit but still had to grind man like i, I'm, I was still in the library fucking pulling mm-hmm. 20 books out trying to write a paper there was a like, question on a 
I can't remember if it was like a game show or like a trivia game I was playing recently, a few months ago. And it was like, these are two types of what? And it was like MLS format and something else. And I was like, bibliotech. Uh, yeah. What was that called? Bibliography. Yeah, bibliography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bibliography. Fuck. And no one are... else in the room knew it. They're like, what the fuck is that? And like, I guess oh. they don't have this anymore in... In writing papers, I, I don't know. Did this change? I don't think Everything's so. Everything's probably all automatic. You just use a third party app and fucking. I remember there was Chicago, you. there was MLA, APA, and there's yeah. another one. Because I know what for every fucking yeah. reason, history, they they switched some it. classes, they made you switch, and I and that shit pissed me off, man. That kept me up like another couple hours in the library, like last minute for paper. youngins who are l- younger than 30. A bibliography is basically writing down the publisher. Of the book, basically. What book you got this information from? What pages it was Your on? Your footnotes, yeah. Oh, you put like a little dash by the quotation if you needed to. Yeah, fuck. Spending many, many hours uh, going over that. I don't, I don't regret any of my university either, man. Like I, there's the intangibles that you learn, like the critical thinking. Everyone, that's a cliche, but I, you learn to work hard too, I think at the end of the day. And I'll take it all, man. It, it still made me a better person, I think. As much as I think now, like growing up, I wouldn't need, like I, there's different avenues to go down. Mm -hmm. I might've answered what you were going to go on there. Like it was, it was kind of the way to cut you. I still, it's a cookie cutter kind of thing, but I, you know, is the way to do it at that point. But now, fuck, you could, I could teach myself all, all those, everything I learned, I could teach myself. There's so many more, um, like avenues on the internet to do that. Right. What did you take? So you said. University was helpful for you because me, it was not helpful at all. Almost a waste of three years, basically. What did you take away from university? Because it seems like, well, now you like are working with your brother, self-employed, basically. Doing nothing, nothing similar. Remotely to- significant to a history degree. And most of your life experiences come from traveling, probably. Correct. So, so what did I? Yeah. What do you I, take I, away from it? That's a that's a good question. I did take like I think it gave me enough like like a shock therapy and a bit of discipline that I probably mm. needed. I would say that would be the biggest the biggest thing. Um, th- definitely the what it uh, and I guess maybe what I like the classes I took compared to like a business degree or your kind of standard maybe even general studies. Like I what I kind of harnessed in like the end of my <laughs> university career too is. I was like, I was wanting to take some courses in like random things that I could like expand my mind. And that's where, that's mm-hmm. what it, 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 the benefit for me. So I was taking religious like studies classes that to me to this day were unbelievable. Like they opened me up to different like teachers and, and philosophies and thinkers that I might, I would have maybe like stumbled upon them on my own, like in this day and age. But mm-hmm. at that point it, they brought me to them, I think sooner. Mm-hmm. And so being able to do those classes, that was the benefit for me. So like religious studies, uh, humanities, like learning about philosophy and learning about the world, like that helped me, that informed some of my traveling because I would learn about places and, and peoples and histories of, of these spots I wanted to go to. Um, so for me, I think it uniquely like helped me out and I could see where others like, dude, I, I don't, cause not a lot of people know, like I left, I went to SFU. And then left to go to BCIT to do accounting because that's what I thought my dad wanted me to do. And I could have taken over his business. So I actually bounced for a year and I had to reapply back to SFU after I said, fuck that. I had another epiphany before the, <laughs> the law school thing where I was doing, I lasted a semester doing classes at BCIT, like where I would think if I did a whole, this is a long winded way of me saying, like if I did a whole like university degree of business. Mm-hmm. I would have not fucking lasted, man. That is fucking brutal. Where I was lucky enough to do an arts degree where, you know, a lot of people will chirp it and say whatever they want about it. But I, I took some fucking classes that, like I said, expanded my mind, expanded my thinking, um, showed me what this world, like what's out there. So I, that's, that's where, um, it's, it was an awesome experience for me. Do you think it actually showed you what was out there? Because I feel like everything... I was forced to. I was forced in a way to to see what's out there. So like on a syllabus, I, I can remember it like vividly to a religious studies class where I was forced to... I had to read these like four novels that semester. 
I don't know if I would have ever fucking read those four novels on my own. But those novels showed me like four different types of philosophy. So one was like existentialism, which really uh, kind of blew my mind at that point. Growing up as like a like in, in a Catholic system, um, it kind of like blew my world up. It's like, holy fuck, there is uh, kind of another way to look at this life. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at your belief <clears throat> system. So yeah, would I have gotten to that? I, I, it's, I, don't, I don't like looking at like kind of like... Um, uh, hypotheticals. I, I I fucking don't know if that would happen, but it, it forced me at like 22 to to fall like to run into this wall, and read this book and be like, holy fuck. Let's throw everything else I learned before this. Like it's a whole new kind of world to to play with. So that that's I think a powerful thing. And now again, did university do that? Was it the? It might have also been the professor. Like he was fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think like. Again, I'm, I've like read enough now and like, I, I think the system's flawed enough and like the university system now where you, like if you were a young kid now, 19, I would tell you not to go to university. I'll tell you to go use like Khan Academy, go, go online and do it all for free. And I'll fucking throw you some books and some, some ideas. Like go, you can go study this on your own. Or just go meet people and go use their people. experience, yeah. right? hundred percent. Whereas, <clears throat> so Again, I see like there, there's a positive to university at that time and mm-hmm. maybe still to this day, but I can also see how you can go about it yourself mm-hmm. and not go through. Cause at the end of the day, the one hit I will have on like universities or like the one negative is like, it's a, it's an antiquated kind of way of learning, right? Like it's, it's a cookie cutter way. Like, just like, um, I know like my brother didn't do well in, in school and he is a fuck. My brother's a fucking very smart guy. But it, it, according to book smarts, he might not have done as well, but that doesn't show his potential, right? Whereas me, I could like, I could fake it till I make it in like book smarts. Like I wouldn't, I could just fucking study the night before and I'll mm-hmm. get by, I'd cheat my way through even if I had to. Mm-hmm. But that, what does that show about the system, right? Like it shows. <clears throat> well, that's the thing is I think a lot of, maybe not a lot, a, a lot, a lot of people figure out what that system is. The system is regurgitation. So for me, I can honestly remember in high school thinking my job right now for this class is to get 80% on this course. How do I get 80%? It's not to know everything in this book, in this stupid book. It's to consciously think about what is the possibility of a a teacher asking me this question on on an exam. Yeah. If it is high likelihood, I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to read it a few times. If it's not, I'm skipping over that complete chapter. Buddy, I would break it down even to the next level where like, what's the bare minimum amount of work I would have to do to achieve X grade? Right. That's <clears throat> my whole fucking university degree. Like that's my whole university. Mm-hmm. Now that's not maybe a great mindset. Like that's not maybe a great way to go about it. I still, well, actually that was maybe my first like three years of university. I extended mine pretty, I, I think I was at SVU for six years. Um, <laughs> just trying to live the dream every, every year. But No, I definitely like approached it differently, like in the latter years, like when I actually enjoyed the courses I was doing, but before it was just like, yeah, I knew I needed to get this grade Mm -hmm. because I knew I needed to get this GPA to get into law school. Mm -hmm. And so I, yeah, like looking back on that, like, fuck, it's kind of not a great way to go about it. But when I actually started taking courses, because I think at my heart, like one of the, I I love, I think any human loves to learn. Like I, I love to learn actually, like it sounds kind of fucked up to say that but like i enjoyed a lot of my later <laughs> years at, at in university like taking classes that i act, like thoroughly was like i looked at the syllabus <clears> and i was like okay i'm taking that class because i'm just genuinely interested in it i think there's a lot of people that like learning though there, a lot i just is. think the system is so narrow-minded into this one let's say five percent of people yep. do really well in this system but 95% of people learn other ways, right? You're exactly I love right. learning. I love, I literally, a goal of mine for every day for my entire life is grow every single day. And learn something fucking new in a way, right? Like, But for yeah. me, I like that through podcasts. I like that through conversations. I like that through understanding people's experiences, what they went through and how they learned something from that rather than like regurgitating from information from a textbook made in 1973. Buddy, you're learning the exact same way. It's just through a different medium. Like it's... And people get caught up on that. Like that, I mean, our culture is caught up on getting a fucking piece of paper at a university. 
through that medium, like through yeah. through grinding mm-hmm. midterms, studying all night, like cramming. Like that's it's all been culturally like crammed on our throats. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, do I look at it now? That is a bullshit way of going about it. But mm-hmm. I also just try to take the positive of it all, man. Like I I took some dope <clears throat> courses. I got <clears throat> to travel and <clears throat> fucking learn and now yeah i can learn in different ways like i learn way more from fucking podcasts 100 percent. then i even learned so it's funny you brought that up so <clears throat> i know i listen i have uh, i listen to hardcore history dan carlin he's fucking legend i have fucking learned more through his podcast than i probably learned through my undergraduate degree at sfu as a history major it's so, so i'm what trying that show? it i am trying it carl i'm giving it a shot <laughs> It's so dry. It's it's dense. Oh, so you? It's so I, I think you dry. might have talked about this. Or? I'm a big fan of Dan Carlin. This guy's trying to get. I do. Into Which episode did you get him the on? The Mongol one. Yes. Okay. That's a that is a fucking awesome yeah. one to get into. It it is. It's a lot to digest. At, like, don't get me wrong. Like, they're four hours long. Almost some of them, right? You're not listening to those all the way through. Like, mm. I would digest them at, like an hour at a time. I found they were good for traveling. Like, I would be on a fucking ten hour flight. I'll crush that one of those episodes. Like Maybe that. that's the problem for me is that it's, when I listen to podcasts, I'm not 100% engaged. Yeah. So I'm going for a run. My mind is traveling oh, to work things and other hard, things. Yeah. I'm, I'm at the can't driving range. I'm in the car, like thinking about work stuff all the time. So I would have prefaced it like for hardcore history, you need to, there's a time and a place for that podcast. So maybe on the flight to Palm Springs, I'll listen to that, it. That's, and that's what I would say. And I think that that's true for a yeah, lot of podcasts. Like right? true crime you, podcasts, right? Because if you miss a couple of things and you don't know what the fuck's going on. You're exactly right. But for hardcore history, especially, I would, even when I was traveling, like I would, okay, I was going on a bus ride. It would be like two hours at a time. Let's take that in. Two hours mm-hmm. at another time. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another great one, History on Fire, I listened to. Um, and that's a little, it's much shorter. It's like, he does like hour and a half episodes. His name is uh, Daniele Bolelli. He's been on like yeah, Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has his own podcast called The Drunken Taoist. Yeah. If you guys want to check out a podcast, it's dope. So he does much shorter history um, kind of episodes. And they're really, they're a lot more like, um, they're a lot sexier, if, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like he does one on like Caravaggio, this like crazy Italian painter who like was actually like murdered people in the streets, like on a monthly basis. Like this guy was fucked up. So he does like crazy history episodes on that. So to me, like when I like get fired up about this stuff, like that shows what podcasting does. Like Mm -hmm. the medium, like, dude, I I wish I could have learned so much through podcasting. Like when I was like younger, I think you could have, I could have not gone to university and then like learn through podcasts and have the same amount of knowledge, if not more. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of crazy. You look look back and think of like, there's certain points in your life that are just like drastic changes. Yeah. So like for me, one was getting out of basketball and just understanding that business excites me more than, or as much as basketball did just in a different way that yeah. actually I can succeed at because I'm not six, nine. Divorce is going to look like, I think it's going to be a big thing moving forward. Getting into podcasts. Sure. I think for me, obviously getting into real estate was a big one too. Getting into podcasts for me, I think, is a big thing. I, and I think in 20 years from now, I'm going to look back and look at the two people that told me I need to start listening to podcasts and just be like, that was a game changer. Really? Totally. Who, are those two people? Who are those two people? Jamie and Lucas. Nice. Sick. Mm-hmm. Nice. It's just so, like, I'm upset. I'm completely obsessed, as you can probably tell. I listen to at least three hours of podcasts a day. Just Beautiful. running in the car, whatever. Anytime that I can't. You, I don't really like listening to them while I'm working. Gotcha. It distracts me a bit. I get caught up in them and then I like forget what I'm supposed to be doing. So it's more just like passive for me. Mm. So the Dan Carlin thing where you have to be engaged 100% is a challenge for me other than maybe on a flight or something like that. Yeah. I think like that's almost like an audio book, right? Totally. Exactly. You have to be prepared yeah. and <clears throat> that's what I try to do with those because yeah, they're, they're dense, but he is, he he's a genius at how he, he gets his point across and this, like the research he does mm. and the way he tells a story. And he, he was in radio before he has that voice too. that, but he, he just, yeah, man, he, he does a great job, put that together, but you're right. You have to be in the right mindset before you get into that. To get but then there's, that. I mean, I listen to some like more lighthearted podcasts, like the, like the spin chicklets when I listen to, I mean, I can put that on in the background and I do my work and listening to it. And it's just, it's sport talk, right? Like mm. it's lighthearted. It's whatever, but it's, 
I still enjoy it, right? Yeah. Um, and then there's other ones where if I want to really have my attention like on something, I'll I'll get into it. Like I'll delve into these history podcasts or or other ones, right? So there's any anything you want, man. It's out there for podcasts. Yeah. That's what the, that's the beauty of it. I I love it, man. It's such it's a cool crazy. platform. It's kind of cool how it's coming back to voice now, right? Yeah. Like radio is so big in what the '60s and '70s. I think people are just lack like then there's, there's, there's a lacking of genuine conversation yes. in our mm-hmm. culture. Like you turn on the TV, it's all the, sound by bullshit. The right? CBC fucking general, you ask like the most basic questions. Don't Dude, even what, get a real answer. How are you going to get an answer from like a true answer from someone in like a, a minute thirty soundbite? Yeah. And it's I, I'm just regurgitating what other people say on podcasts. Like it's literally genuine conversation is the way of the future. It's how we, I think it's how we evolved. It's how we we it's how hunter gatherers were living like hmm. you were talking around a campfire every night whether that was like strategizing how you're going to get your food the next day mm-hmm. or like just like socially like we're social beings right like we want to just bullshit talk about fucking rumors whatever like you, you made a g- good point like it has that community feel to it right it does so you're, sometimes you're listening to a podcast you just feel like you're just one of the guys I in feel, that room you feel right? like you're in the conversation yeah, exactly. even at times right which mm-hmm. i think like mentally is probably an awesome thing like especially sometimes life can life can be lonely at times if you're especially if you're not even if you're not in a relationship even if you're in a relationship like just nice to be a part of like a random conversation i think there's some something like healthy about that and then yeah like podcasting like this like i think it's a very like uh primal nature i've learned right? so like, we've been doing it for one year now it's been, what one, are we? It's been one year like what episode is this almost, carl or? 79 80 something somewhere around like there yeah I'm happy to be on like the one year. That's fucking dope, man. It was, I think it was a year, a week ago, something like that. Yeah, probably. Good for October you guys, man. Like yeah. So you can, and you can almost have that perspective now. A year in, like, so like, what have you learned? Oh what have you, like so much? Learn first of all, learn so much because we've had some pretty cool yeah, guests on, for sure. But even literally, what I've learned is you can learn something from every single person you meet. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they're a teacher, a plumber. This like multimillionaire business person. I don't doesn't care matter. what you do, man. Like, and that is a, that's kind of a beautiful thing too. Hey, like, like everyone. 100% for sure. It's, it's, so I learned this from a podcast, man. I listened to, it's called Tangentially Speaking. Uh, his name's Chris Ryan. He's been on Joe Rogan a couple of times mm-hmm. and I love his podcast. And he literally, he'll have on like the most random people. Like he met a guy to, he met a guy, he, he gets his van and he just mm-hmm. drives off and like, we'll go camp wherever. He met a guy at like a stop who was like cycling and they just started talking and they just like hit it off. He did a podcast with him. He did a podcast with like his mechanic who ended up having like a crazy life story, like moving from India and had like, had took his motorcycle from like India to like Alaska, like on like a boat. It's <laughs> so like crazy shit like that. Like he, yeah. he just, he just started talking to random people and he said this, he echoed the same kind of sentiment. Like you can learn something from any human being. Like we're all, we all have a story to tell and that's, that's fucking dope. Like that's, it's kind of, it's empowering, right? Like if we bring it back to university, now that I'm kind of thinking about it a little bit, I think the biggest thing it taught me, cause I, I, from the actual material, I didn't take much away from it, mm-hmm. but the biggest thing it probably taught me is to be open-minded because the system in general is flawed. So what I'm doing here, I'm getting nothing from. I hate my life every single day waking up and doing this. But this is a system that someone generated back in time that is not correct for everyone. Mm-hmm. And I'm... What did I say? Oh, and it taught me to like, to question things. So like in my head as I'm going through it, I'm understanding that this is not right for me. I've never been this person. I was told that an accountant is a good job. So I'm going to do accounting classes in school. But like going through the process, I understand that this is fucking painful. I yeah. hate every single day. Waking up every single day, I'm dreading driving my car to the school and going to class every day. So it's coming from super conservative family. This is the path you need to go. University almost was like, it, you don't have to do it that way. So it, it, was, that, it was beneficial in that way where it made you question it like be able to open my mind a little yeah. bit because you meet people there as well you different, who come from yeah. different backgrounds, different opinions, but almost, anything. yeah, just push me in a direction of like, 
Don't ever think because someone told you something that that is the right thing to do. Question the shit yeah. out of everything. Fuck yeah, man. You got to question every day, man. Hmm. I, yeah, I agree. It's, and I, it's good that you can take like a positive out of that, right? Like, that's what you have to do. But yeah, I, qu- I question, question everything. The fuck wants to just, why do you want to just roll with like the status quo? <laughs> it's so boring, man. And that's what, like, I don't know. You, that's what politics wants you to maybe to, to run along with or society or. Yeah. Fuck it all, buddy. Even in, rebel. Even in like our group chat. <laughs> Like I almost get pleasure out of just saying something just that stirring the pot, people right? are going to be pissed off about. Like Mike Lowe, especially. I I fucking love it, man. Stir it up. I love <laughs> chaos. Like I'll comment like once every two weeks and yeah. it's always a dig at Mike. <laughs> Keep it coming, man. I think you guys both revel in that too. Like they, I yeah. think you guys both get fired up and like it's, it's one of the funny relationships I've ever seen. Like <laughs> just who can, who can chirp each other worse or like rile the other guy up. Like it's a beautiful thing, man. I told Mike we're going to have him on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be the ult- oh, man. It would be the a back and podcast. forth. Like, can I be just like a third party? Like, <laughs> just, dude, just to see that. But you got to keep it. Yeah, I, I'm a big buddy. You just got to keep it going, man. Keep it, keep it fresh. Keep people on their toes. That's what life's about, man. Keep learning every day. Fuck yeah. That's not, like I said, that's what I'm trying to do, man. Push myself every day. Learn. Live. Fuck. It just go it, all this shit lends itself to like cliches, but it's just like I don't care. It's one day at a time, buddy. Just live, enjoy it. We can wrap up in two minutes, but remember, I'm I'm cool whenever, man. <laughs> we were pretty good friends in high school. We were, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like we hung out after practices and stuff. Especially, yeah, I remember when you because you came grade ten, yeah, and we got pretty tight probably that even even that year. I think that year. And probably a lot of it was fo- through football for from sure. what I, th- like, I think. Yeah. For sure. You were feeding me young stud tight end. And <laughs> you came in QB, took the jaws and we, what? Well, grade 10, we fucking went undefeated, right? Like mm-hmm. fucking killed it, buddy. It was a good year. Yeah. No, we, yeah, for sure, man. And it was cause it was crazy to see too. Like you came like talking about like how you grew up. Like I was kind of moving away from like being like super like Christian Catholic and you were like the complete opposite with your family. Right. So it, for me on that, like, it was cool to see that and see like this new, it was just like a new kind of world, man. I don't know, imagine what you were thinking at that time, but uh, it's, fun, it's funny to look back. Question. It's, funny to look, it's funny to look back. It's funny to look back at it, right? Like the human I am today is just so different than that so grade different, 10 right? kid. And for I you, it was like so weird, shy like, and new scared. Sc- oh. well, new school too, coming in, like trying to make new friends. Like, I, can't I knew imagine. one person. I knew Carl from basketball. That was That's your kind of. Like, I think we had played one summer together, maybe. It's crazy to look at that too. Like, I got to give you credit, man. Like, you came in, yeah, new school. You having to like adapt, make new friends. But it was pretty easy. You can't, if I'm not mistaken, you came in. We early. We had the we had football like in August, mm-hmm. and that kind of made your you made yourself known kind of then. Which so it was luckier for helped. me than Marty because I had football training camp to meet a bunch of people outside of classroom stuff, and. Luckily, I was athletic and good, so yeah. people liked me, right? Well, we're going to grab, yeah, like you were a fucking stud. We're going to gravitate towards mm-hmm. you, like, right away. Like, you're not going to, like, chirp this guy, like, <laughs> who's this guy throwing dimes, like, right <laughs> to me here? Like, yeah, no, that, but I don't, like, underestimate how, like, that's huge, right? You had those two weeks where you had those connections. Like, you were coming into the new year, the new school year as, like, one of the guys again, right? So, like, that was, so that was the cool thing looking back now. I don't, I never even thought about this before, but day one of school it was like people introducing me to other people rather than me being like oh hey i'm the new kid it's it was huge, like des man. and you and mike like we had battled through whoever, two weeks of training sean like, boza walking down the hallways being like hey this is denny yeah yeah right like he's just one of the easy one of us like you were, and and super unique again and like lucky that like stm the football kind of like where football was placed in that totally. school like yeah we can look at it now and it's like buddy you're putting a fucking pedestal like totally I think a couple of those kids in that team should have been like expelled from the school according to <laughs> other criteria of what other people got kicked out for. Like I think uh, the starting running back lit like a firecrackers off in the ho- in the hallway like during school and didn't get expelled. Mm-hmm. But like, do you know what I mean? Like, so we were on like another level where it made it a lot easier to kind of fit in. Let's, you feel a bit invincible, don't you? Yeah. You do, right? When we were in grade ten, I hit a girl in the face with a snowball. 
I thought you said closed fist. I, <laughs> no, definitely not. Oh, that wasn't the case. There's a snow uh, oh. It's like started. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. I don't someone, have to say anything. I someone in no our, names. Someone <laughs> broke a window in the snow wall. And injured a poor soul. And <laughs> someone, that guy was carried away like a criminal into like the principal's <laughs> office, man. That poor bastard. Yeah. Man, there's so many high school stories we can go oh, to. I, I'd love we to. We gotta talk. We cannot. End this podcast without talking about Cologne. I love how you uh, you wanted to roll the dice that talking about say? that, buddy. Yeah. So <laughs> I I'll never forget to this day in the hallway, you and me, like pulled out of class, and that motherfucker had on. I I hope he doesn't listen to this because I just call him <laughs> motherfucker. No, he's a great guy. Um, he had on uh, the greatest tie I've ever seen to this day. It had like it was like a casino themed tie. <laughs> I think it had like a roulette table on it. It had like some dice. And he essentially like stared us both down. He's like. He rolled the dice. He's like. You know, he's like, do you want to roll the dice? Because like, we were just. The theme, we, yeah. we fuck with his class. Like. Oh, dude. I think that's where our friendship blossomed. Like probably, probably. in some of those moments. Probably. Like, because you didn't give a. You, you were like, you were just staring him down. And I was too. Like, I didn't give a shit, man. Um. <laughs> We were being a little rebellious, but oh fuck, he was on another level. That guy. Do you remember that comment though? Yeah. Oh yeah, that you said right back to his face, right? Yeah. And I knew right away. I'm like, this guy's good shit. <laughs> <laughs> do, you yeah. remember, do you remember the comment? Or? I, yeah, I remember it very vividly. Oh. He said something like, "If you guys don't smarten up, I'm gonna call your parents." I'm like, "You're not gonna do that." <laughs> you called his bluff essentially, like it was a poker hand. Yeah, and it was so. Th- like it, it fit in so well with the 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 tie he was wearing. <laughs> I think I lost it, and I'm like, yes, you Daddy. Did. I think I I was trying to like I was laughing so hard. Oh man, we got we got away with so much shit. The other class we got kicked out of a bunch was Lane's. Remember Lane's English class, yeah, grade ten, man. shiny forehead and all. I remember. I remember. So I remember <laughs> one time me and Ferrari at same English class, grade twelve, get grade ten. We get kicked out. I don't know for nothing, bullshit, just, just talking stupid, or some yeah. shit. We didn't have phones then, so it wasn't like being on your phone. So we're in the hallway just like chatting. We're out there for ha- probably half an hour. And Lane comes back out. He's like, any whatever scolds us. And I go back in and he looks over Ferrari. Ferrari's fully asleep. <laughs> just passed out on the wall. And Lane just stares at him. He's like, well, I guess he's going to stay out here the rest of the class. No he just way. leaves you. I don't remember this. You don't remember that? You're fully asleep. This is unreal. <laughs> but we, you forgot to mention, like, he was the what offensive line coach. He was a junior football guy. So he didn't, you know what I mean? Guy. Like, he was part of the system where, like, you just let it go, man. You just let it go. I, mean, I don't even remember that. That is an awesome story, though. That sounds, man, I used to sleep quite a bit. I was quite tired in high school. <laughs> so many J.R. Davies stories, oh, too. Oh, man. Like, I, I'd love to have, we got to get in the next podcast. <laughs> Let's, a little more STM uh, nostalgia. Just have everyone share a story. Oh, dude. That'd be funny. Just because I I bet you, like, like even you just bringing that up, I didn't remember that. Like, everyone telling stories, we'd probably remember some shit that... Because it's hard to remember all that, man. Like, I... Yeah. I think some of the hits of the head probably affected some of the memory loss there, but... Oh, fuck. I wouldn't trade high school for the world either, man. Like, it was very fortunate that I, I had, like, a good high school experience. I think we were all pretty fucking lucky, eh? Right? Like, wouldn't mm. you, I'd say like a majority of people would say the opposite, right? Whether they were bullied or like just moving all the time or you name it, right? Um, and I think that had a lot to do with like where I'm, like how I feel today or my Even mindset, the shift right? for me from Holy Cross to STM in grade 10 was, was absolutely life-changing. At, ST, at Holy Cross, it was like, it wasn't as sports focused. It was a lot of like back in the day, Surrey kids who were like skateboarders and I had nothing in common with them. Couldn't relate. So I had yeah. like maybe two or three close friends that were like athletic people. Interesting. Outside of that, it was just like, it was go home and that's it. Whereas really? STM was like a completely different culture, solely, like very solely focused around sports. For sure. But and if you were, if you excelled at that though, you also, it more or less, you excelled at like everything else. So mm. I think like the staff embraced you, like the teachers, like- mm. And then that drove you. It was a. It was kind of a good. It was a good system. I think. Like, as much as I don't agree with, we can get in the whole religious side and stuff. I think like 
that experience was was awesome man and it's cool to hear you like say that like it was so, honestly in. man it was so different and what is that it's hard say? to even explain i think it says actually even more about like the um lucky enough fortunate enough to be like the guys that we were growing up with like our age group mm-hmm. even you know like that i think that's because most don't have that like jamie jamie has like a couple friends from stm but it's not like he has jordan and like a couple others from his age but it's not like this group no right it's fucking crazy man mm-hmm. yeah i don't like i it's it's a classic example like when you're in it you don't really take the time i try as i get older to to take a bit more like have a bit more perspective on things yeah. um because yeah you just lit like i'm just living it. i feel like it's normal which is probably fucked up right like yeah trying to get perspective on like different things in life but yeah we're lucky to have good friends and still like be pretty tight man the only person I don't appreciate from that group is Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I could, I, I have no comment on that, but uh, yeah, I just, I would like to see Mike uh, defend himself. <laughs> you know, just be honest. You don't I, like it. I gladly, I gladly take uh, either of your sides in a, in a fight. Oh, come on. If you had to pick one. I couldn't say, man. You guys are both good guys, man. I. Uh, it's not about character here. It's about who could fight. <laughs> No, no comment, man. I, I'm gonna go no comment. <laughs> okay, let's get out of here. That was good. Thanks for coming out, man. That was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, buddy. I love you.